good morning everybody good morning 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 hello good morning, morning. Good morning. Good morning. A very good morning to everybody. Yeah, morning. Uh, um, I'm going to ask uh, everyone else except uh, Brian and uh, my colleague Shayla to stay on video. Everyone else, we're going to request you to mute your video and mute your sound as well. Uh, my name is Fred Ross, and we're going to set this up right uh, in the next uh, two minutes. Um, so kindly, um, if you are not Brian, kindly mute your video and mute your um your microphone as well um a quick note for all participants this meeting come on wh whoever is speaking please mute your video and kindly mute your videos and microphones as well Oh. Um, please, please, please mute your video and mute your microphone. Kindly mute your video and mute your microphone if you're not speaking. Persons refusing to mute their videos, we shall remove you from the call. Um, Brian, I think you're muted by mistake. I'm going to try and bring you back up. I, I think I'm unmuted now, yeah. Okay, uh, and I'm wondering whether Shayla is unmuted too. Oh, Brian, uh, brilliant, fantastic. Uh, everyone else, we're gonna mute your videos. Dear friends, could you kindly mute your videos? This activity is so. That's all I've done. I'm still showing. Everybody, please mute your video and your, your microphone. Yeah, I've done that.
Fredros, you've muted yourself. Yeah, I think. Are I... you um, are you talking and are you still there? Yes, I'm right here. I'm just setting up the live video. So I guess I have to do this announcement again. Um, uh, dear everybody, because the meeting is oversubscribed, we are trying to route the rest of the people onto our live YouTube channel. So apologies for the slight delay. We have an over oversubscription and that's why we are starting late. Um, um, and uh, please bear with us when we do that. But we're going to be setting up in the next two minutes, uh, most definitely. Uh, Brian, I hope you don't mind. Uh, okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm just confirming that the YouTube channel is live and then we will proceed. Fedros, it seems to be, it, it is live. Uh, we can see it on YouTube, just confirming. Back. This is the magic of Brian. Uh, it's <laughs> probably not very popular, actually. <laughs> Everybody's it's, sitting uh, around waste, wasting their morning or afternoon. <laughs> No, it's it's all good. Uh, I actually think uh, that uh, we should begin uh, now. Um, Sheila, can you confirm that you're still online? Can you bring back your video so we can begin? Yes, yes, my video is on. I can't see you. Okay. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, could you kindly mute your videos if you are not speaking, except if you have uh, Professor uh, Greenwood. Uh, Dr. Eshetu, kindly mute your videos. Professor Yuan, please mute your videos. All right, uh, I believe we can start now. Once again, uh, uh, my name is Fred Ross, uh, Ifakara Health Institute. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome all of you one more time um, into this uh, event. Uh, I
Please don't mind that. <laughs> I, I don't know how that is going to go. Oh, man. I can remove people, right? Good. We will remove everybody who is not muted. Like I just did. <laughs> so, <laughs> Brian, once again, a very good morning to you or a good afternoon. Good morning. Good, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, how are you doing? In, um, are you in London at the moment? Yeah, or, uh, well, I'm sort of, I live halfway between London and Cambridge in the UK, where I've been living for about the last, <laughs> last year more right. or less housebound because we've not the London school has been closed since March so we've not been able to go to the offices and I've not been able to come and visit to, in Africa which I've been very sad about which I normally is one of the highlights of, of my career um, but hopefully yeah. we're getting near to the end now um, I've had my had one of my doses of vaccine which is good news so That's I hope nice. hope we'll be being able to meet personally and travel again you know at least by the second half of this year which of the vaccines are you taking uh, so I, we're doing a trial of uh, in malaria vaccine in Burkina Faso and Mali um, this is a uh, the RTSS vaccine the one that's been most widely used and we've been no I was asking I was I was asking about you said you've taken your first dose of the vaccine I was oh, asking I my first of the vaccine. yes I, I had the yeah. Pfizer vaccine yeah you had the Pfizer vaccine okay so yeah, but... you do a second dose in a week's time. Um, All right. Okay. So I, I guess actually the, the point that you're raising is a wonderful point, place to, to begin this uh, conversation, uh, uh, Brian. The statements, the long road to malaria elimination. Mm. How accurate is this statement? Or shall we say the very long road to malaria elimination? I, I think it is a long road. It's going to be a long road. You know, I've been at this game for about... Uh, 50 years now and there has been a lot of progress in that in that time um, but it's not easy you know the malaria parasite is very complicated the mosquitoes are very clever um, and to think that we will do this very quickly and so many times in the course of this long period really probably a hundred years or so people have been tr really trying to eliminate malaria there have been highlights people think DDT comes along people think this is, this is the answer then get DDT resistance we get the advances in genetics when people think that they'll be able to make vaccines very easily and so on there's a lot of excitement and then rebound again and so on and things but it ha I mean there has been progress and I think you know right. Bob, Bob Snow shown pictures sort of 100 years of malaria it has been going down progressively over that period for various reasons but I think we've still got a long way to go. Were there times in, in your career uh, when you guys thought that we were very close to elimination B before 2007? No, I've never really felt that. I mean, if you're in on the ground um, seeing what's happening in the pediatric ward, you know, the, the hospital in an area where there's very high level of transmission in Africa, it's really right. difficult to think that that's going to change totally in a, a in a short time. Right. And actually, I think that's a, that's a wonderful part to start, uh, 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 Brian. You spent, a, a, you know, most of your career life, shall I say, uh, working in Africa. It's only very recently that you've moved back to, to, to England. And I would like us to, you know, continue our conversation. Uh, at the time when you first moved to Africa, went to Nigeria, to, to Northern Nigeria, uh, and I would like to ask you to discuss with us here what the situation was like uh, moving to Nigeria. And I, reading your work, I recognize that when you first came to Africa, you didn't come to study malaria. You, you were studying no. something else. Yeah. No, well, I, I, I mean, just a little bit of my story so people know, know a little bit about my background. I mean, I trained in the, U, in the UK and after working in the National Health Service for a bit, I thought I wanted an adventure and uh, decided to go to Africa for that. Most people went to the United States at that, at that stage for their sort of um, postdoc or to their PhD, but I decided to go to Africa. And that was quite unusual at that time for uh, people from the UK to go to Africa. And I, I first went to Abaddon in the south of Nigeria um, and to 
because I had done a study in, um, in the, I worked in the UK in a rheumatology department looking at people with arthritis and autoimmune disease. I started looking at that in this big teaching hospital of Adam, which some of you will, will know, which is one of the biggest and uh, most specialist hospitals in West Africa at that time. And uh, you can see there that photograph is, I was very lucky to have a, a social scientist, Mrs. Barlow, who helped me to learn how to work in Africa. She's a very good linguist and so on. And we went out following up the patients in, in the rural areas. And it emerged that really that autoimmune diseases were very un uncommon in Africa. And that's probably not a, ge a genetic thing because autoimmune diseases like systemic lupus erythematosus are quite common and more common in um, Americans of African descent and particularly in, in the West Indies and the Caribbean. And so the idea was really what, what might this be due to and one of the obvious things was to think about, well, was, well, could this be the effect of parasites in particular malaria on the immune response? Um, yeah. And that might explain why that there was this difference. And so after a couple of years, two or three years in Nigeria, whilst the civil war was going on, it was quite difficult to do research. I went back to the UK yeah. to uh, learn to be a clinical immunologist and did some experiments. Then there are some mice called NZB mice that, um, <clears throat> get a disease very like systemic lupus erythematosus. So we decided to give them some malaria when they were baby mice and lo and behold, um, they didn't get their autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, uh, you know, as a young first early researcher that led to a paper in Nature. I thought, well, oh, this is really great. This research, yeah. is, <laughs> research is easier. And so that was how <laughs> I got into malaria. Um, and so then, this, this is a you've described this previously as an early precursor of the so-called hygiene hypothesis. Is that, I, is that I, right? It, it was I, because people sort of forgot about it. Part of the problem was then in the immunologists, you know, we, we just about knew about T and B cells, um, but we couldn't really take those experiments any any further. And it was really dramatic. I, I, these were very special mice. They came from Texas. Um, I was very lucky to sort of get them because I had some contact there. And I think I had 13 um, in each group and I used to take them home at the weekend to look after them because they were so, my future research career <laughs> depended yeah. on, these, on these mice. And, and all 13 of the ones who were control mice got systemic lupus and the other one, the baby ones, who'd had the, the ones who'd had malaria as a baby didn't. So it was pretty, yeah. pretty dramatic. But then we couldn't take that research any any further. Um, right. And those experiments have been done again. I mean, it was true. Um, and then, as you say, the sort of hygiene hypothesis came along, um, which the idea that your exposure to infections can alter your immune response to yeah. other infections. And, you know, that's one of the theories that's possible about why COVID hasn't been quite so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 I, I was going to. Ask, ask that actually, but go ahead, please. No, I, and then you know, then it came on the idea about allergic infect, allergic disease as a background of particularly worm infections affecting affecting that. And I think partly suddenly people have started. I've had people from America ringing me up about this and things, you know, asking that. So people have got sort of quite interested in that idea. But I think we do it. It is important for malaria because we know now that some of the malaria vaccines don't work so well when right. when they're given to people in the malaria immune area. Um, and we know that some va other vaccines don't work so well if you've got malaria parasites. So definitely it's not surprising that having repeated infections with malaria downregulate your immune system. Um, right. That's probably a protective effect. And that may have some helpful consequences as well. So, so let us sh sh move you know, several years forward um, do you remember the first time you, you came to Africa? Was this early 80s? No, it was much earlier. It was 1965. It's 1965. No, 60, uh, yeah, 65. Yeah, sorry. So you were like uh, 20 years old. I was about 20 years. I mean, I'd, I'd done my training in Cambridge and London, and I'd been an wow. intern, you know, hassle for about two years, I think. And then so I was quite young. And that's why that lady, Mrs. Barlow, was so important. <laughs> because yes. wandering around, you know, running around the bad and the back streets and right. so this is taking a photo. I had a, a a generator in my Land Rover 
and that's an X-ray machine. So we were able to take photographs of John Santi. But much more right. importantly, she she was a trained social worker, um, but she taught me, you know, how to behave properly uh, when nice. you're doing your field work and things. And I've always been very grateful, very grateful to her. So that was, nice. and then the Civil War came um, a bit after more, and I was very yeah. in. I, there were two uh, hospitals there that sort of colonial guilt, perhaps, which were built just before independence, you know, which was University College Hospital of Baden and McCary, you know, and those two hospitals were up to the best standards of any hospital yeah. in the United States. And the first generation of Nigerian scientists, I mean, we had, we had uh, Nigerians, um, brain surgeons, cardiac surgeons, and so on, and things so who'd been trained overseas. Professor Lucas, who some of you will have known, was head of the Department of Community Medicine before he went to WHO. And so it was uh, it was very strange. We had sort of eight doctors on the ward and things as, as you would have done in the, in the UK. Wow. And yeah. then the Biafra War started and most of those doctors were um, <clears throat> from the from Biafra. So they left and suddenly I found myself in charge of the ward. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, which I've never done before, and so on. Um, so, so, so re reflecting on that period, um, mm. uh, and, and we move now, you know, sixty years later, mm. and and we are here. <laughs> and you know, a few weeks ago we had a masterclass with Abdisalan uh, Noor. Yes. Mm. And, and 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 he described the, the entire process how they they draw up, they they come up with these reports. Um, the, the, the entire procedure that, that goes into that uh, and, and why we should be worried. One of the things that, that he emphasized was uh, this idea that yes, we've had a lot of reduction in malaria, but now we start to see this flattening here towards the end. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and the situation is worse for, for African countries. I would like you to request uh, uh, you to look at this in a little more detail and talk to us about why, and in your opinion, we didn't see this coming and what went wrong? And yeah. why is that curve looking like that? Well, I think, I mean, just go backwards a little bit. You know, I mean, if we go to the left on that graph and you go back to when I first went to Nigeria, you know, about half the children died before they got to the age of five years or something. And probably a high amount of that was, was due to malaria. So there was, pro there has been fairly, steady progress and that accelerated then for about 20 years um, after I came back, went back to England for a bit, then went back to Northern Nigeria and that's into the 1970s. And then malaria was completely neglected then for the eradication program failed that the, and nothing really happened then for about sort mm -hmm. of neglected years. But malaria was going down a bit then. And then you know, 20 years ago or so, um, it, controlled activities were reactivated and people got interested in malaria and that has come progressively will come down in deaths and cases and as you point out sort of two or three years ago we got stuck and um, <clears throat> I think that's clear first the first year it was thought it might just be a bump in the graph but now it is clear that we're not making the progress that was expected and if we're going to get down to that goal it's going to be uh, we're going to have something new is going to happen. So the issue, I think, really is, you know, why is that what has actually happened? Um, and when we look at that, the problem is in Africa. Um, if you look in Southeast Asia or in, in America, with one or two exceptions, South America, one or two exceptions, the, curve, the graph is going down still, but it's in these really difficult countries in, uh, in Africa where the transmission is very high, where we seem to have got stuck. Right. So in, 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 in the period you were saying earlier that even before 2000, you had a little bit of reduction. What do you think what that was associated with it? I think it was um, education, um, uh, probably better treatment, primary health care, because, you know, primary health care started in the, in the late 1970s. Um, yeah. So there was, there was I, I mean, what happened was that no, I think it's 1969 when the initial malaria eradication program failed. It was um, WHO said, "No, well, we can't, we can't eradicate malaria." So that, uh, some people then forgot about malaria. But there, 
they did suggest, well, the focus has to be on malaria control then. And then with primary health care coming along um, and there was extension of the health services and so on and things. So I think that there was better treatment then. Um, right. So there was, there was some progress then, but it wasn't really until 2020 or so that the graph really started going down steeply. Right. So but today when you're speaking to... Uh, Bob, Bob Snow has shown that very clearly. When you look back sort of 100 years, um, you do see the graph going down. Yeah. Uh, actually, I think I, re I remember uh, the conversation with Bob, uh, him suggesting that part of that was just very good access to chloroquine. Yes, I, I think it was. Um, and I mean, if you... And there was... Did, did Brian get muted? Okay. Bri Brian is on mute. Hi, Brian. Are you are you back? The admin can unmute him. Yeah, I'm trying to unmute him. Um, You lost me, I'm back, yeah. yes, okay. okay. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know what happened. Yeah. No, so there was, pro you know, there was progress going on. I think it probably was, I agree with Bob, it was more access to treatment. I mean, there was a lot of chloroquine being used. Yeah. Sometimes for children with other causes of fever, not malaria, but then you would have got some prophylactic effect from taking chloroquine. Um, right. And if you tested the urine, and I mean, that was done, some people did surveys, they tested the urine and you found a chloroquine in nearly all of it, you know, and certainly in the cities, there would have been a very high proportion of the children would have had chloroquine in their urine. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Brian, t today, I mean, with all this experience that, that you have, you're talking to a number of scientists on the call here today and also a number of practitioners. Mm. What do you think are the big questions they should be focusing on? Uh, uh, in the next 10 years? Yeah, well, I think, you know, one, I think your graph here shows one of them. <laughs> you yeah. know, what are we going to do um, now? Because unless we do something more, those, that, the blue line's not going to become the green, the green line. And I think my, my main concern at the moment, really, is that we sustain the financial and political support for malaria control. Um, right. and that's going to be a challenge. Um, it's a challenge in the countries that have got to elimination, and we might come back to that later in the conversation, you know, for them to keep up vector control uh, or whatnot if uh, to do that. But for what are we going to do in these countries, largely in Africa, six out of the 10 in the WHO high burden, high impact group are in the Sahel countries. Um, right. And we won't be able to do, the scientists, we won't be able to do anything or, uh, malaria control people unless we have money and political support and that's going to be really difficult to to sustain initially at least you know and covid's not going to help with that um as most of western and wealthier countries are building up huge big debts that they've got to pay off um the economies of many of the countries where malaria is endemic have, have, have suffered um and we see this in the uk i mean shockingly the uk is is reducing its aid budget by 30 percent it's reducing its budget for research in lmic by 70 percent um, and if other countries do that do the same you know um, and the endemic countries which we hope will be contributing much more in the future their economies have been damaged as well perhaps not quite so much you know it's, it's and we're going to ask you a lot about this this subject afterwards but it's very interesting that uh, you are talking things developmental, you're talking things financing, you're talking things regulation. You are not talking about a new drug, a new med bed net, a new that. So uh, all, all these thoughts, we're going to talk to you about that uh, going forward. But first, uh, my colleague Sheila has some questions for you about this. Yeah, yeah thanks, Fred. So, um, Brian, so currently uh, the malaria, the global technical strategy, for malaria uh, is basically based on three pillars. Um, I was wondering what your suggestions are, because uh, 
it's being revised. So I was wondering what your suggestions are. How can we improve this uh, to make it more efficient or how different should we, um, should the strategy be moving forward? I think, well, I, I mean, there are, two, there are two sides to that, which don't exactly fit with your, with your pillars there. But I mean, one, there are still things we can do to improve coverage with our existing tools. Um, and well, I step back a bit, I'd say even before that, we need better surveillance data collection and so on to know what, to know what the issues and what, to, what we should be doing where. Then we can improve coverage with the existing tools. Not every child sleeps under an effective bed net. Not every pregnant woman gets her, her monthly IPTPs and so on and things. So there's definitely things we can do that. And there are various ways we might want to talk about later on, how, how you do that, bringing in the community more and so on and things. But then I, I think you know, strongly that in those really difficult countries where the vectorial capacity is so high that people are getting bitten so often by, um, by mosquitoes and by infected mosquitoes that we're going to use some, need some new tools. Um, I don't think that improving surveillance, improving data collection, using it very effectively, our present tools will be enough in those countries. But in a, a lot of places it will, and we will see malaria go away. Um, but none of that can happen unless there is the money, and uh, you know, the, I think it's that also is leveled out, like the like the graph of deaths. Um, <clears throat> yeah. I think something like totally budget is about three billion now, um, and it's sort of level. If that drop starts to drop off because funds are being diverted to post-COVID, to climate change, well, I mean, all important things, and biodiversity and so on and things, then we're not going to expand either the implementation of our current tools or the development and introduction of new ones. Um, so number one, keep up, and that's going to need advocacy, um, which is some people, you know, it's a lot going on now to do that, but not letting malaria drop off the agenda of, the international community or of the countries where malaria is still a, a major problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, thank you. And thinking about um, new tools, um, since you published, Fred, could you move to the next? Since you published um, your paper in 2008 mm. um, on parasites, Fred, could you move to the next slide? Uh, is this one? Yeah, yeah, thank you. On the progress and perils and prospects for eradication. I was wondering, since that time up to now, what are some of the key advancements um, that you feel are the most important with regards to malaria control? Since we are talking about um, encouraging the use of new tools and the development of new yeah. tools, what are some of those key advancements well, in the space of malaria? I, I think it's interesting. I mean, if you think about what, you know, there has been a lot of progress in the last 20 years. The, deaths have gone down, the number of cases has gone down, um, and uh, in many countries, about 20 countries or so, the elimination has happened. That has nearly all happened with better use of existing tools. Uh, I know we had bed nets for going back to the 1980s, the insecticide treated bed nets. The SMC is a reinvention of things that have been done a long time ago. We do have an effective drug and so on. So that, that progress has been made possible by better use and more extensive use of, of really old tools, spraying IRS and so on. They're not new things. Um, but I think we're getting to the point when we have got as far as we can in the very high transmission areas with very effective vectors of what we can do with those tools. And I can give you an example where we're doing a study in Burkina Faso in Mali. There are some children in our trial who've got a, a new insecticide treated bed net. They have good access to treatment. They're getting SMC and some of them are getting the RTSS malaria vaccine. And malaria is still the most important cause of death in that community in children under five and the main cause of severe admissions to hospital. So, you know, what more can we, can we do with the existing tools that we've got? Yeah. So I think in, in those areas, we're going to need new tools. And what those might be, I think one 
potential game changer is gene drive mosquitoes, um, <clears throat> which is, you know, we may want to discuss a bit, bit more about that. The other is a malaria vaccine that's more efficacious than the ones we've got at the moment and goes on long, longer. And there may be something completely novel that we haven't thought about, some very clever um, method of, of getting, uh, right. getting rid of your mosquito vectors or something <laughs> and so on. That, so it's really important that that, that sort of research is innovative. Some people would call it blue sky research continues, knowing that most of that will actually fail but something may come out of that. But I can't see in those, like the area where we work in Burkina Faso, us eliminate, stopping transmission completely in those communities, unless we have some new tools. We're definitely going to, um, um, you know, ask you a lot about, about this, these new tools. Mm -hmm. One reason that this specific publication of yours was interesting to us was just to look at, you know, how much discovery and technology development has happened since um, since these huge investments began uh, with the Mr. Gates call in 2007 about malaria elimination. What has come out of that in terms of innovation and, and, and technology I, and development? Yeah, I, I mean, we have better drug, you know, the, one of the disasters was that when chloroquine failed, that wasn't appreciated fast enough um, and there right. wasn't a change over to the ACT. So definitely the ACTs were a, a big advance, but it, it, it's not a new paradigm. It's just <laughs> finding a drug that's effective at killing, uh, you know, treating people who've actually got clinical malaria. So it was not a completely new new I idea, but that, I mean, that was obviously important. R RDTs probably was. I think that is a, a, a novel thing that happened then because people did just re previously rely on, on, on blood films. And we know that you know, RT, RT, using RDTs in the community has been an, an important contribution there. Right. And, then, and then nets, you know, people had used bed nets for 100, 100 years, <laughs> not perhaps, well, they'd used insecticide while well, once treated with DDT and things for a long, a long, long, long time. So the idea of yeah. using bed nets was not entirely novel, uh, but it right. was improving on that, um, getting your insecticide into the fibers and so on, which is an important advance. So those were, were serial steps in improving existing tools, but there was nothing right. um, completely novel. And probably the first novel thing was, was having a vaccine that, you know, that does work at all. <laughs> Yeah, Let, let's hold the hold the, the, the vaccine thought um, there. Earlier on, um, um, when you started responding to Shayla's question, you mentioned the issue of access. Mm. Uh, and uh, this is a publication that you wrote with uh, 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 Professor Mutabingwa, Mutabingwa from Tanzania uh, uh, in 2002, uh, very interesting piece. One of the things that you mentioned there was the idea that improving access itself is very, very uh, key yeah. um, in, in, in everything that we do. It's not just the presence of the intervention, but just access to the intervention. Mm -hmm. Now, our colleagues from IDM, uh, Amelie Batozzi has published this work. I, I don't know if it's online already, claiming that, you know, it's sometime a good idea that, you know, whatever we have, let's just improve access because it appears that when people have access, they actually use, yeah. use the tool. So a question to ask for you, when you started working in Africa, the health system wasn't as strong as it is now. What lessons can you share with us about improving access to malaria control tools, be it diagnostics, be it bed nets, be it that? Where are the gaps today? What progress has been made? What should we do, uh, do going forward? Well, I think, you know, at that time, if you turned up at, turned up at the regional hospital or something with malaria, you probably got pretty good treatment then but it was access to treatment was limited to the middle class and perhaps people in the urban areas or areas where there was transport and so on and things that and really nothing was happening in the rural communities um, the virtual, unless they were near to a mission hospital perhaps um, and what did change that was taking malaria treatment and more recently diagnosis into the community you know to having community having access having people access to treatment nearer to home. And so that, I think that, and having an effective drug with chloroquine, which it was then, and then later with ACTs. So 
access has been absolutely essential for the for the treatment side of things because there's no use having a, a brand new if very effective drug if people can't get access to it so i think yeah. that was probably one of the main things that did result in some improvement during the sort of period of malaria malaria neglect um, before we started distributing um, nets and so on and we, i think and also access to antenatal clinics has improved you know a lot in uh, I mean, it's sort of 80% or something of women do actually go to an antenatal clinic now in across sub-Saharan Africa. Um, but they don't all get their four courses or whatever um, number of, yeah. of doses of IPTP. So there's still things going to do that. Now, how could we improve? How could that be improved? Um, and I think this is where, you know, the social sciences, um, community workers and so on really have a really important part to play um, in yeah. knowing how we can increase coverage, get, making sure that every child who's exposed to malaria is under a bed net, that the women do get their four courses. And that's sort of, there may be some logistic things to that related to delivery and so on things, but there's also a community, um, need, there needs to be a real push from the communities to, right. to, to do that. And I think we've learned a lot um, in the past, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, I think how to activate communities to be more, more involved. And that was really important to keep that going. So one, one uh, question that um, I'm sure many people ask you this uh, <laughs> several times, because you, you became quite uh, vocal about this in, a, in a, a 2008, 2007, 2009. You once wrote this paper asking whether malaria elimination is really a good idea or not. Uh, and uh, I, I believe this was prompted by the announcement in South Africa by the Gates Foundation about malaria eradication. Yeah. Uh, I, Brian, a question to us, looking back to this period, do, do you have a different answer to this question? I, I, I never thought that malaria, nobody sensible could say that. <laughs> Eradicate, if we had a means of eradicating malaria, we wouldn't do it. I mean, I know there are some entomologists who are very possessive about their, their mosquitoes and wouldn't like to see their mosquitoes totally eradicated. Um, but, I mean, you know, we, if we could get rid of the malaria parasite, I think that would be a, a good thing to do. So I, th I think the discussion then at that time was what what proportion of resources and research and investment should go into elimination uh, and what into control and then reducing the burden of um, deaths and, and severe illness. So I think that was the debate. It was not that the debate, and, and I did have, and other people did have some concerns that there was a risk that everything would be going into, uh, all the resources money would be going into some, country which had a small incidence of an area, say a thousand cases a year, and elimination, stopping transmission in that country, whilst there were still hundreds of thousands of children dying in many parts yeah. of Africa from the disease, which we you know nothing too much was happening about that. So I think it, it's always been getting that balance right, not that yeah. you shouldn't be doing one or the other. And I think probably now we've come to actually, I mean, I'm, some of you may know, I mean, I'm chair of the WHO committee that certifies elimination of countries, you know, when they've done, when they've done that. So I'm sort of in the elimination camp a little bit now indirectly. And I think we have come to yeah. a, the balance between that. But I think there were very, it was just coming from the Gates Foundation a little bit when that, when Mr. Gates said that, you know, that there was a danger that everybody was going to just be focusing on the low transmission areas where elimination has been relatively easy and about right. relatively easy I said no yeah, it's not easy not, but about 10 countries have actually achieved that you know in the last 20 years or so and been been certified um, but you, you just certified El Salvador yes we just certified El Salvador but right. you know the, the trans transmission was limited to uh, um, various for lo quite a long time they're fortunate that that around them the, Malaria has gone down in the in neighboring countries and so on. Yeah, I mean they put a big effort into it. It's cost a lot of money and so on. But compare that with trying to eliminate malaria in DRC, for example. Yeah. You know, it's a completely different 
situation. And um, it's great that more countries are doing that. Uh, the next one on the list is China. And we have a meeting actually on Friday with the first thing of the elimination committee meeting with the Chinese colleagues because um, they've applied for certification of, uh, of malaria in China and they've had no indigenous cases for the last three years and you know and that's big news. So could you, while, while you're on that topic uh, Brian could you just for, for the sake of our colleagues uh, explain in, in like one minute what does it take to be certified by WHO as malaria free? It's fairly simple you have to have no indigenous cases for three years and you have to be able to prove to WHO or its people they designate to look into that, that you would cope with very effectively and efficiently with reintroduction of a, a case. So, uh, I mean, in China, they have lots of workers coming back from Africa um, who are bringing falciparuma and vibacarum and other from the Middle East and thing or India with vivax malaria. And that's okay as long as those are detected. Um, and mm. managed and appropriate screening and vector control and so on happens. So that's allowed, but you, you must not have any local focus of transmission for three years. Right, right. Um, um, in the next one minute or so, Sheila has a question for you related to, uh, uh, to the, the, the point about resources and elimination versus no elimination. But before that, a very, very uh, a quick point here is you were part of the steering committee for the Malera program in 2011. I believe this started in 2001. Yeah. The IS Global Malaria Eradication Research Agenda. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in 2007. And there's, there are two things that I see from the graphics that you produce at the time. This item of CERCAP, uh, <coughs> single uh, radical cure and prophylaxis. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and then the the, the issue of surveillance as an intervention. I know from the GTS that surveillance as, as an intervention did happen and yeah. it, it became part of GTS. Mm -hmm. But what's, what is the progress with this um, single so, radical so cure? Single treatment. I mean, again, I'm not an expert. I mean, MMV has been, you know, one of the, is the key leader in developing new drugs. And they really do have quite a good portfolio now of different drugs. And certainly that is still the aim. I mean, you know, we might, you know, what would my, what would my be wish list for new interventions? Um, and one would be a highly effective drug um, that was, you could take just one dose and it also had transmission blocking activities as well as getting rid of the, Asexual things that were causing causing the illness, um, and that as you know, that is still an objective. I don't know whether we have anybody from MMB on the call, but to, might want to comment that. But that is still the long term goal. It's been a bit more difficult, I think, and there's perhaps been a bit of backsliding to say, well, if we had a a, a really effective, say, easy to make drug that you did have to take for three days, that would still be very valuable, and I, I agree with that. Um, yeah. But perhaps a bit more attention, you know, the, having the transmission um, blocking component in that um, is perhaps more important as, as we do shrink the map and more countries do get near to elimination and so on. That could be very valuable for them. Um, and right. I can use single dose primaquine, um, and we do now have tefenaquine, but just to have something in you could give to children with malaria, one tablet or couple of tablets one time that also not only cured them but also had transmission blocking activity that would be really a, a, a very useful tool yeah. no no thank thank you so much uh, Sheila please yeah thank you Fred um, so uh, Brian um, given the work that you've done uh, with some of the scientists um, on the shrinking malaria map um, I was wondering, and now we are now thinking about the high burden to high impact strategy. I was wondering, in your opinion and your experience, what are the differences between these two strategies? And what does this new strategy bring, uh, bring forth? I, I think, I mean, the, the difference is a biological, I think is the difference is a biological one. You know, it's, it's, a, it's the vexes <laughs> that, that 
where you have an extremely uh, uh, efficient vector in very large numbers biting people. So, that, I mean, children may be in parts of Burkina Faso, Mali, and northern Nigeria getting bitten by an infected mosquito at the moment once every every night uh, during the rainy during the transmission season and and we've gone an enorm enormous way in those areas i mean we know that smc was developed at that thing you that reduces um, incidence of infection by about 70% from if you don't give give smc and uh, we know now that we can do more by adding a vaccine um, a bit more and so on and things. So we are using and using perhaps a PBO net in that area because of our, this resistance. So we really are doing everything that we we can do, and we should do that. And at least that will should maintain that line flat, not going up. But I think if we really are going to go turn it downwards much more steeply again, we are going to use need some some new new tool. To do yeah. that. And I think it's been important that that's been recognized that I, I know um, the director of the GMP, Dr. Lonzo, I mean, he, I think he believes that. And that has been an important, uh, important step really to recognize that there is a problem there and just that more of the same um, will not do that. I think we will shrink the map. Um, as we said, there are more countries that are pretty near. I think they're about 20 countries now, which have hardly any uh, malaria, just a few cases each year. Those are not in that middle. We're look, we looking at the map. You know, they're in Southeast Asia and South America, Central America, around the edges of Africa. But there is this really, which really tough area, which is the Sahel and the, that central bit of Africa, the countries like DRC and things, where transmission is so so high that the tools we've got at the moment are not going to be enough certainly to get elimination yeah thanks brian and there's a question in the chat box mm. uh, is malaria eradication possible in african countries yes <laughs> everything is possible <laughs> is it going to be easy is it going to happen soon i mean if we mean getting rid of the last Malaria parasite, parasite which is what, yeah. what, what, eradication, yeah. you know, I yeah. mean, that is the last malaria parasite. Is it possible? Yes. Um, I mean, one helpful thing is that if we're talking about falciparum malaria and vivax malaria, we don't have an animal, an animal host. This is becoming more of a problem, in, particularly in Malaysia, where um, they're not far off eliminating human malaria, the human malaria infections. But if we can, include Plasmodium nolzai um, in that. You know, if they get rid of Vivax and Falciparum, but they still have nolzai, um, would we say that they've eliminated malaria or eradicated malaria? But I don't think that's yet a problem in Africa. Um, but, and there isn't, a, as far as we know, there isn't a, an animal vector. So that does make it a bit easier than for these diseases when you have a, an animal or in a domestic animal or wild animal ve vector. So biologically, I think, yes, it is possible, um, mm -hmm. but it's going to be really tough. <laughs> and, so, so. Yeah, and because, ahead, um, sure. sorry, Fred, and because you, you've been in, in Tanzania and I'm sure you've been to Zanzibar as well. Yeah. Is Zanzibar on the way, just like you mentioned? Yeah, I, 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 Zanzibar, definitely. It's definitely easier on islands. Um, and you may know that there's a, a, there are plans to try to eliminate malaria on Bioko Island off the coast of, of um, West Africa. Um, and that, you know, they're planning to mass vaccinate the whole island, um, give everybody MDA, they have the efficient um, vector control program there and so on and things. And that may be possible there. Um, and then they would have to have very good surveillance Afterwards, uh, there are people coming across on boats from the mainland. You'd have to have checks for those people arriving uh, on the mainland and so on. But imagine that compared with, you know, imagine the middle of DRC um, or the areas where the uh, Ebola is going on, the, the challenges of that um, sustaining your elimination status there or for three years, you know, no indigenous cases. Um, it's, it's 
that really is going to need a, a, a nationwide and Africa-wide initiative. I, I, things are shrinking. I mean, things have changed a lot in the Gambia and Senegal. Um, the malaria has gone right down in, at, near the coast, but not yeah. as you move in towards Guinea and um, where there's still high transmission going on there. Um, yeah. So, yeah, let's shrink the map, do that, but we come back to the same question, how much of the resources and effort goes into shrinking the map compared with doing something in, in Central African Republic or DRC? So, so that's an important question. I mean, you raised it earlier as well. When, when the decision is being made, uh, one of your concerns when you were talking to us earlier was that you were worried that funding would go to places with very little malaria. Yes. Just for the sake of attempting elimination. Yes. I think, yes. Is, I mean, is, that, is that an ethical decision to make, or should we just go by the drive that, you know, zero well, is good numbers? To who, makes those, who makes those decisions? Um, and it's not the person working in the, in the Ipacara Health Centre, probably. I mean, they can have their opinion or make suggestions or so on. I, it, it is the politicians uh, and the people who have the money. Um, and that's where, you know, that's where the big decisions come from. So if, if there are, if people, and we've seen this for every time, if people have large amounts of money that they can invest in a particular area, then that one will tend to get, tend to get priority. And scientifically, that might not be the right, the most sensible thing, thing, thing to do. Um, but fortunately, I mean, WHO is probably the, uh, organization that is best qualified and best judged to make those sort of decisions um, because they are meant to be reflecting um, yeah. you know the world and all the partner countries and those who've got malaria looking after their interests and so on so that's important um, but the I mean the risk is in a particular country you may have one particular minister who has particular interest in something and the efforts all go into into that because he makes the money available um, so we we do want these decisions to be guided by by the science um, you know and not by political or uh, financial regions and, and they're difficult isn't they not easy decisions I mean I don't know what's the right you know where you so, so 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 Brian sorry to, to to dig deeper into this so the, the shrinking the malaria map approach was also based on science. Yes, and yes. High burden, high impact is also science. So, um, I mean, you've played on both sides. Um, <laughs> yes, yes, I what, have. What, in retrospect, what, what should we do? Should we be putting resources in the middle of the Congo and Nigeria much more than in the periphery or? I. I, I think it's very, you know, it's very difficult. One person shouldn't be um, making those sort of decisions, but it, it is, yeah. it shouldn't be unbalanced. It shouldn't be 90, 90%, 10% either, either way, that that is wrong. I think it has to be, I and mean, we shouldn't let that happen. Um, it has to be somewhere in the middle there. And it, that depends on you know, the particular circumstances. I mean, there may be somewhere where malaria is a really terrible problem, but there's civil unrest and you can't, you can't, the health system can't operate and so on and things. And then you wouldn't do that. I mean, it would be, you wouldn't be sensible to be putting money into that. Um, but there was a danger at that time that the too much focus would go onto, onto, onto the low transmission areas and elimination and then you could say, you know, uh, isn't that wonderful? We've eliminated malaria from our country and it's a fantastic job we've done. It has gone down from 100 to naught cases. Balancing that with all the people, all the children who are dying somewhere else because they're not getting bed nets or something. So, so I mean, that's the moral that they know. That's a, a dilemma. Um, and you want a really good group of people covering, um, and we may come on to this a little bit later, covering the different aspects of malaria, you know, your entomologist, your economist, social scientists, and so on, and trying to come to a, a reason, the balance for how you, do, how, you, how you do spend that money. Okay, uh, let's move forward uh, uh, now to the next point. We, we would like to discuss with you 
a, a little more about the subject of bed nets. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and, you know, I, I don't know about others, but there are a, there's a small group of people today who contributed a big, a gr great deal of evidence uh, towards the utilization of, of, of bed nets in the early days. And, and one person who is probably most synonymous with that is, is yourself. Uh, this is your time in the Gambia. Uh, you are in the Gambia. You, you remember your observations in Nigeria, the bed net used there and the bed net used in the Gambia. Uh, based on this, you set up some observational studies in the Gambia. Uh, this is even before ITNs come, and then ITNs come and you know this. And uh, here is a publication that uh, was not even a randomized control trial, but was very powerful. Uh, uh, and I pulled up some of the pictures here uh, from your early um, uh, bed net treatment campaigns in the Gambia. Uh, Brian, at this time, people weren't listening to you people, but you, you kept going. Talk to us about what you guys thought was what, what was the motivation behind pushing forward with this agenda at a time when nobody was listening? Yeah, I, I, it was tough. I mean, it was an interesting story because it was, as you said, I, I mean, I wandered around you know, villages in, in uh, northern Nigeria a lot and we very rarely saw a bed net there. When I came to the Gap Camp, you can see that picture there. Bed nets had been used for about 50 years at least before that. And in lots of poor villages, people had the bed net. And so it was, it took a little while before they appreciated that. You know, why, this, this is a bit odd here. Why is that, why is that been happening? And then we started to look at the literature. Well, do bed nets actually protect malaria um, against malaria? And there were virtually no, no child, uh, child. So I mean, it was pretty obvious that they would do if you had an effective bed net, but there really was very different data to do that. So that's when we did the first uh, observational studies to see whether actually people who slept under a bed net did have a, an ordinary, these are ordinary bed nets, you know, um, did have a, a protection and, and they did, but not very, very good. But then as you came along, you can see in that picture, then we started dipping, the idea came of dipping bed nets in insecticide. And that had actually been done with DDT in the Second World War, but people have forgotten about that. Um, yeah. So doing that with permethrin and so on and things. And then again, seeing that we did this series of studies in the gap, the gap and really they showed that insecticide treated bed nets were better and that if you treated the whole community, so everybody had a bed net rather than just individuals, then you got the bigger effect as well. So those were important studies, um, but nobody really was very interested in taking it further. And it was quite difficult to, Get it yeah. in, in there. And the person who did, did actually was Dr. Dr. Tori Godan in, in TDR. And then he was the person who um, raised, raised some money, I don't know, um, and initiated four sort of four trials to say, well, was this study in the Gambia a fluke or did they not do it properly or something? Because it was a pretty dramatic result. Yeah. Um, and so TDR deserves a lot of credit for that. But I, all that process took a long time. And it, it is, brings up another issue of if you are a researcher and you find um, some encouraging results that could potentially have public health implications, are you the right person to, should you be pushing that? Because you may, you might have a an interest in the company who's making the insecticide. Um, should you be pushing that with the, your National Malaria Control Program, with your Minister of Health, with WHO? Or should you stand back? You put your paper in the Lancet and say, well, that's up to other people to think whether they want to do that. And, and that is a dilemma, I think. Um, at my time, we were taught more that it's not your job as the scientist who does the research. Your job is just to present the results and then get on and do the next next study. I think things have changed a bit with that. Um, we, um, and the whole sort of process is, is more efficient when you have WHO's impact and its various subcommittees and so on and things that, so that more reasoned decisions are, um, are, are made by a group of people. Um, but perhaps, you know, well, not, not perhaps it probably is true that we were guilty at that time of not really pushing bed nets 
hard enough saying that something should really happen about this and shouting a bit and becoming an activist um, rather than just moving on to, well, let's see what happens when we use them in the country as a whole and so on and things. Um, right. And that's saying with SMC, I mean, SMC is even worse. I mean, at the same time as this, we did a study of SSMC, which showed it reduced mortality um, substantially in children if you gave them antimalarials during, during the rainy season. And nobody was interested in that for 20 years. And right. again, we, it's quite difficult. You move on, if you're a scientist, you have to get your next grant, you move on to something else. Um, and perhaps we should have, both with Bednet and with SMC, we should have stopped and put more effort into being an advocate, you know, and really pushing. But I mean, it's, already, it's, it's very, it's clear that, uh, I see on this list you have uh, Pedro, you have Joanna. Mm. Um, I believe Jay Armstrong is Joanna Schellenberg. Yes. Uh, uh, I see yourself there. I mean, you you still in the and, and Fiona is there. Steve is there. You you still in the game uh, many many years later. So you <laughs> for actually a question a related question here, um, which is very relevant to this master class is mm. this was a very good example where epidemiologists were working with vector biologists mm -hmm. and everybody else. Was this by design always, or is I, this something that I just think very interesting. I, It was a, I, that, I mean, there is a supplement to the transactions of, of um, the Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, which sort of describes the, the, the bigger study that, that we did from, you know, from, from that, that, that first ITN studies. And in that, there is a paper by a social scientist, um, an economist who happens to be Anne Mills, who's um, now deputy uh, director of the London, London, London School, um, and entomologist and epidemiologist. And looking back, I, it, that sort of happened um, because it seemed the sensible thing to do if you were going to suggest a new intervention um, that you wanted to know what the community thought about it, you know, would they like it or not like it? Um, and what would be the cost and, and, and so on. And so that I think in some ways that was a, perhaps a more important study than actually the outcome of the, of the bed nets because it did show the need to have a very broad base of having people working together, having the entomologists working together, the epidemiologists, the clinicians, uh, lab people, and but also the social sciences and uh, and the economists. I know it's been, I mean this is a bit self-serving saying this, but when I I remember when referees were putting me out for a prize at one stage, that was the thing they picked on. Actually, this was yeah. the most important thing. This was actually showing that when you're doing interventions in malaria, it is to involve people across the disciplines um, and all working together and. You know, there may be some people on the call who were in that in that right. group, and we like working in teams. Um, I think that's a something we, we're we're good at. You you develop a, a pride in what you're doing as a group, and so on and things. And I, I think that was a very important lesson to learn from that from that study. Thanks, thanks a lot, uh, 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 Professor Greenwood. Taylor, please. Yeah, um, so uh, the question that I've always had, so say uh, we have a scenario where we have, say maybe the best vaccine that is really, really effective. Do you ever foresee the withdrawal of um, the bed nets, bed nets use? Or what I, are some of the scenarios in which you would foresee the withdrawal of bed nets? Yeah, I mean, I mean the reason why people use bed nets a lot in the Gambia, and it, it was part of the brides, when somebody got married to, of the, the things that went for the bride, the presents and so on, the things would have been a bed net. And that really wasn't to stop malaria, it was to stop people getting bitten at night, you could be bitten a hundred times in the night by a Nepalese Gambia in the rainy season, uh, to stop things dropping on the, on the bed. And in also, uh, <laughs> because you, it's a polygamous society there. You might have two or three wives in the same room. And those that you saw the picture, that very heavy bed net, 
it gave them some privacy in that. So it was really for social reasons. Now, if there wasn't any malaria, and I guess that's... You mean this one? Yeah, it's that one, yeah. Oh, okay. It gave her like a little room for the mother to, you know, for the mother to, to live in when there were other people in that room. And uh, uh, I think it would be interesting. I mean, I haven't asked anybody recently from the Gambia what's happening because in that area in far off any, malaria has really gone down to a very low level of transmission. I, but the vector is still there. So I suspect people are still using bed nets quite a lot. But so I think bed nets are the most effective too, where there's a lot of biting going on. And if that's the case, then people will go on doing that, even if they've been vaccinated against, against malaria. There may be some other areas on the, on the margins where people are not bitten so often that they know they don't have a risk of getting malaria, um, then they might not be so keen on using using a bed net. But I still think people are going to want effective bed nets that yeah. if the vectors are still there in abundance biting them. I'd still use my bed net. <laughs> if, I, if I was in the village in the Gambia um, sleeping out at night, even if malaria disappeared. Shella, do you have additional questions for them? Yeah, there's a question in the chat box that really relevant to the use of bed nets. So it goes, how can we tackle the issue of low use of um, LLINs? Yeah. You have, yeah. But I, I mean, the, one, one is you have to have an effective one. Um, I mean, that if people are not getting protected, you know, that the mosquitoes are still biting them, then they're not going to use them because that's I think is the main reason why they're doing it is to stop getting you know the nuisance of being bitten by that um, yeah. so, but if you're going to use this as a tool and really to persuade people then it comes back to what we were talking about at the beginning I know it's this it's no use just telling people you have to use a bed net it has to come from the community uh, sensitization and uh, advocates in the community who are persuading people to do that. This is a good reason why you should do this and explaining it properly and so on and things. Um, and I, it, that, that's hard work, um, it, persuading people to do behavioral changes that they wouldn't do otherwise. It's hard work doing that, but I mean, it can be done. Um, and it's very important that that, that that happens. And the danger is if sort of malaria drops off the agenda a bit and there isn't quite so much money around and things those are the sorts of things that will drop off you know that that we need to, and fortunately we have some very strong advocate groups for malaria keeping up that message and, and, and supporting local in-country groups to keep up the pressure use your bed net why you should do this and so on and then making them available so actually maybe at that point we we can uh stop a little bit and answer, address some of the, uh, uh, Professor Greenwood can address some of the questions that we have in the chat box. I think to begin with, it might be a good idea to allow some of our National Malaria Control Program coordinators who are on the call to respond directly to some of the questions. And the first one we would like to invite is Dr. Prasad, uh, uh, who is the director uh, for the anti-malaria campaign in Sri Lanka. There, as you know, Sri Lanka has eliminated malaria recently. Uh, and it would be nice to hear, for example, how do they sustain uh, this intervention? So what happened? So Dr. Prasad, are you on the call, please? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, actually in Sri Lanka, we have eliminated malaria in 2012 and now keeping Sri Lanka malaria free status for the ninth success, uh, successful year. Actually, surveillance is the main uh, strategy we are doing uh, because we are keeping Sri Lanka malaria free in spite of the presence of uh, vector mosquitoes. Actually, uh, our strategies to capture uh, surveillance and capture the um, uh, people who are coming from the abroad uh, actually uh, uh, to uh, early detection. Actually, uh, in Sri Lanka, there's a trend to uh, forget about. Malaria because after elimination, uh, yeah. But our program, we uh, update the uh, doctors to uh, inform that the malaria can come at any time. And yeah. other thing is the vector surveillance strategies. 
uh, we have uh, uh, our regional malaria of uh, malaria regional uh, uh, officers and we are we uh, con continue the surveillance monitoring and we share our information with our uh, they share our regional officers they share their information with our headquarters and we also disseminated and database management actually uh, la line distribution everything we are streamlined for the last uh, uh, a couple of years and uh, with minimum resources we are maintaining the uh, country malaria free the other one more thing i have to tell actually in sri lanka we get uh, compared to the number of cases we get from india and because actually we get more cases from african countries mm. than india actually and that is the I, no, uh, one challenge we have facing yeah i i can comment sorry i can comment on that because i know from looking at when looking at the elimination program and some of the last cases came with some fishermen from sierra leone to sri lanka But to sri lanka so that is not what you would be expecting you know you have to have a very good surveillance okay this the one you got carly may <laughs> comment on that but i think that's true that's some of the last cases came from some fishermen from sierra leone so this is how much people move around um, that's interesting you know but it's going to be so you have to have such a good surveillance system in place to be sure that you're not getting if the vectors are still there to be sure that you're not getting reintroduction and starting off a little outbreak thanks a lot uh, dr prasad for that the, the second person i would like to call is ada ada uh, professor vincent corbel if you're on the call or uh, pia canaval I, i saw you join as well to, uh, to make some comments about uh, uh, the early it and treatments Uh, in west africa uh, just just before the um, um randomized control trials that that brian and team led in the gambia so either vincent if you're on the call or uh, pia canaval if uh, professor canaval if you're on the call hi can you hear me oh yes vincent oh yeah good sorry no no was just a comment <laughs> uh that's yeah first trial actually ontology trial was done in, in burkina faso uh, by something there especially here using experimental earth trial the first time where this kind of tool was used as well to evaluate some uh, the efficacy of this kind of net there was no ap ap outcomes but it's good to remind that the first uh, the first uh, yeah concept came from there and uh, and then we know what has as has, has been developed with itns after afterwards so um, it was just a small comment for all to to know that i think to acknowledge also this kind of, of study of course then a lot of ap trials came after that and 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 was good because it could demonstrate the the impact of of itns on malaria and not only on the entomology aspect so it was great to do this kind of study but uh, it was just to stop uh, for for the story actually just to remind that oh okay i think yeah i think that delta metrin treated that at the beginning all right Uh, yeah, a question to, to thank you so much Vincent a question to Brian here this is a question from Daniel Zioki uh, i believe from from Kenya and his question is what measures should be put in place once a country is declared malaria free uh, maybe partly already answered by the yeah, I mean, I mean that is it comes back to our, the issue of maintaining political and financial um sustainability for malaria control because there's you no know, El Salvador El Salvador's done a good job worked very hard that the it's the money that did that largely came from within the country they have a budget of x million dollars and then there's hopefully there's been a big celebration everybody's very happy malaria has has been eliminated and then the finances are then transferred to covid um and there are efficient vectors still there there are migrants coming in to work um, agricultural migrants and so on so the surveillance system really at the level that had to be set up to achieve elimination really has to be kept up afterwards when you don't have any cases um, and that's going to be really difficult to persuade minister of finance and the minister of health and also perhaps in some cases outside donors to give money to do that um 
And I don't know, maybe I don't know how Sri Lanka is managing with that. I'm sure they are still investing quite heavily in their malaria control program, which you have to do if you, you know, malaria and Sri Lanka had the experience the first time when they did let up um, on their very nearly, I think they got down to 16 cases um, from their first eradication campaign. And then they let up on the control measures and then they had another epidemic. Um, so persuading people to keep up um, the survey, particularly surveillance is going to be a, is a challenge. Um, some countries, it's the risk is, can be identified. I mean, like in some of the uh, newly independent states which border Afghanistan and things, if you have a lot of malaria in your neighboring country, then you can focus your attention on, on that. For China, they have more malaria, you know, from Myanmar on their border, they have this more malaria going on in Myanmar and so on. So you may, they may be able to focus the things, but as long as you have efficient vectors still there and migrant workers coming back from Africa who are still infected, yeah. still a risk, you're going to get an outbreak and you have to have the surveillance system to pick that up very early. And that's going to cost time in training people, have, making sure you have good diagnostic techniques that are available um, and so on. So it isn't an end to have got your certificate from the director general <laughs> and then say malaria done, we can do something else. That's got to be kept. There, there are uh, some comments here about Zanzibar. I think that would be applicable as well. Yes. Uh, but uh, one thing that perhaps we can keep in mind because we have a few questions for you, Alani. There's a question from Mohamed Afolabi mm. about malaria vaccines, mm. uh, with some interesting news that has come out in the past week about a, 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 an SSRNA uh, vaccine. A candidate, I think it's patented by Yale and GSK. We, we can talk about that at, at a later stage because we have a question around that, Mohammed, if you don't mind. Mm. So, uh, Sheila, do, do you have a question on this slide or shall we move? Yeah, we can move. We can move forward. Oh, brilliant. So, so Brian, just for the sake, we'll skip these two slides for the sake of time. But I would like us to discuss with you the question about epidemiological outcomes of vector control tools. Yes, And I think one of the things that you've really imp impressed upon uh, entomologists uh, uh, during your years, and Steve told us this also um, um, uh, when he had a, we had a masterclass with him, over time is, is to convince people to always try to demonstrate some kind of an epidemiological impact mm. uh, of, of, of vector control intervention. Mm. Here is a good example. This is the publication by Sami Bart uh, from 2015, uh, demonstrating uh, about 68, 70% benefit mm. against malaria coming from just ITNs. And you add IRS, there is 80%. Mm. A question to you uh, uh, going forward is, let, let me put it this way. A, a very strong message that has come as a result of this publication is being that you know we have to really push ITNs, we have to really push bed nets, and there's a certain quarter of uh, a certain segment of malaria control officials who think that this message is being carried too far at the expense of other things such as good medicines, mm. such as strong health systems, uh, such as. Uh, 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 you know, good diagnostics or so. Mm. When this was put forth, is this a question of just poor communication or is it really a good idea to keep impressing the fact that ITNs contributed 68, 70% mm. again? I think, you know, it comes back. So somebody, somebody in the National Area Control Program has to decide how to spend their, the money that, what money that they've got from the, from the government and what they're going to spend it on. So that, decisions have to be made and I hope that you know one of the messages that we learned from COVID is that scientists should be the people who are coming forward and giving the scientific evidence why you should do X and X and Y and uh, some people may not know that the chief medical officer in uh, the UK who stands next door to the prime minister on the TV and tells him what to do is actually an areologist um, Chris Whitty, um, you know, who worked in Tanzania for, for a while. Um, and he's a good scientist. Um, and fortunately, much of what's been happening has been guided by, by science. So if you 
I mean, there will be some dispute among scientists, but policy should be guided by science. And if data shows that, as this site does, that the thing that's been most effective in reducing deaths from the burden of malaria has been distribution of ITNs, um, and not, for example, RDTs, or that's been important, then if you have limited amount of money, you believe that science, and it's been done by reputable people, and ideally confirmed by other groups, then you should be putting the resources into what the science tells you to do. Um, you know, and it would not be sensible being presented with that sort of figure, then say, yeah. well, we're going to stop distributing nets and we're going to put all our money into expanding our DTs. Um, right. So I, I think, I, know, I, I mean, we may have, I don't know, we really have time for this to go on to a little bit about capacity development, you know, training yeah, well, capacity well. development and so on and things. And th this is why it's been, been absolutely you know, come so clear that scientists do ca can have a really important thing on, on policy and health health issues and it's really important a, that those scientists are very good and well trained and and so on and things and can, can be believed um but it's better rather than somebody comes along and says well uh, you know why don't you why doesn't country x buy a whole lot of our bed nets you know we'll give you a cheap rate um, or something i mean decision that sort of economic decision be made obviously comes into the equation, but I hope that policy issues as to what to do and how to use your resources should be really strongly guided by what the science tells you. Right. Yeah. Thank you so much, Brian, uh, 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 for that. Uh, Shayla, do you have a question? No, no. No, no, Brian. Brian, let's talk about another subject that is of is very dear to your heart. Uh, this is the, the question of, uh, Chemoprophylaxis. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is this was one of the earliest, you know, technologies you pushed ahead. Mm -hmm. And uh, from from literature, it appears that there were actually quite some controversies in the beginning. And I would I would, I would like to ask you about that. Um, the belief that chemoprophylaxis wasn't a good idea for for kids. Now yeah. this has transitioned. Uh, uh, today we use the term SMC. Could could you just walk us through what this means? Yeah. How it transitioned from IPTI, IPTP, SMC, MDA. What's the with, in a simple way? Where are we with it? Yeah. I, I I mean, the story. You know, we did mention a little bit that the idea of preventing malaria in local populations, the population of endemic areas was around. I mean, this happened in, in 1940, 1930s, when there were anti-malarials. And then the sort of opinion appeared that from somehow, I'm not quite sure why, that it wasn't a good thing. Well, I do have some reason why it's right. It's not a good idea to do that in people exposed to malaria. So prevention of using drugs to prevent malaria is only for expatriates and travelers and the military. And it's not something that should be given to uh, local population. And, um, <clears throat> and it, the reason that was given was that it would impair their immune development of natural immunity. And then if they didn't stop taking their medicine or doing it, then they'd die from cerebral malaria later on. And that was very strongly held and um, some very distinguished scientists believe that, as did WHO. Um, and I mentioned the study, study we did in, in SMC, in, oh, which is now SMC in the, in the Gambia in the 1980s. WHO actually sent somebody out from WHO to stop that study. They said that this, wrong, this study shouldn't, shouldn't happen. Unfortunately, the director of the was told to go away. And that had been approved, has been through the ethics committee and so on. Why, that's why it went on, but that may be one of the reasons why And that was a problem. And I think that the first thing that broke that was IPTP for pregnancy. And then, that, and then that sort of got the idea. And then gradually, WHO and other authorities have, have moved more towards, well, we don't want it's not a good idea probably to give everybody who's living in an endemic area um, anti-malarials all the time, but let's be mm -hmm. about this, see what the science happens and how can we use these uh, 
that give us the most benefit um, that has the least effect on drug resistance and perhaps on immunity. And I got, you know, I brought up my children in Africa in highly malarious areas. They didn't have malaria. And you could ask, well, why should the children of Lake Scratchia going to the same school and living under fairly similar conditions be prevented from getting malaria? And that doesn't happen to children living in the village. Um, if we have the drug and the resources to do that. And so that's why we got into SMC, the idea of SMC um, for protecting people um, against malaria. But then looking at the, because there was so much resistance to that idea, and then looking at, well, how can we do it sort of creep in, which was the groups that would benefit most? And as we said, IPT in pregnancy was one. Then the idea of IPTI, well, maybe we could, there's the Chelemugs and the people in Efikari using that, the port studies showing that uh, there's a lot of malaria in the first year of life. Um, and if we could give antiparamnerals at the same time as vaccination, we wouldn't be putting a huge amount more malarials into the community. We might build, that might be a very effective way of using that. And then the, the in the seasonal areas, giving it to the older children because they get malaria at an older, older age. And then what about mass drug administration? Well, then again, WHO has moved on that. It was very against it for a while. Um, now, the recommendation is in certain circumstances, so if you've got very good reasons for doing that, and it was done during the Ebola epidemic in, in Sierra Leone um, to protect both the health workers and reduce the burden of malaria to do that. And so I think we, we there's, gradually been a, a move away from not using antimalarials for prevention in endemic populations to doing that intelligently and targeted and monitoring it and so on. And I think, you know, it's been exciting. It's been exciting for me to see that happen. Yeah. I think 20 million children had SMC last year and you know, it works. And people again said, well, you can't do it. The community will not, you won't be able to deliver it and so on. Well studies were done rightly going on the science, American consortium did studies, fairly early studies in northern Nigeria showed, well, yes, you could, in a even in a difficult area, you could deliver so, SMC, um, you know, and, and it was. So is, is, is this something, that, and I, I got some data from, uh, from one of your studies here uh, with uh, SMC, yeah. uh, showing pretty good uh, a reduction in malaria and, and parastemia, bisplenomegaly, and, 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 and uh, overall reduction. The the reason that we don't do this in in the south of the equator is it just about stability or is it about lack of medicine? Uh, no, it, it is. It's this. I mean, they're obviously of giving antimalarial drugs to everybody. There's the cost. Yeah. Can you deliver it? Will you enhance rap more rapid emergence of resistance? Um, will you impair immunity? And if you do it for a short time, then stop. So all of those are, are valid uh, arguments. And so what, but when you look at this slide, you know, that's pretty impressive, <laughs> reducing deaths in these children. Nobody wanted to do this. It was just sort of, yeah. you know, thought to do that. And that gradually has been a, a move to say, well, that, let's be sensible about this and not take strong views one way or the other and see how we can do this most effectively. And I think in the seasonal areas where malaria occurs for perhaps four or five months of the year, then you only have to do this for four or five months of the year. If you're in areas, say like in know, North uh, Kisumu or somewhere where malaria transmission goes for nearly the whole of the year, then it's another step. Well, would you do that mm -hmm. um, for the whole year? If I was living in Kasumu and had young children, I would give them antimalarials for the whole year. Um, and so gradually, you know, well, what are the consequences of that? Would that be, would there be harmful consequences for that and so on things yeah. actually to move that? But you wouldn't do that in somewhere where there were, the risk was very, very small and uh, you know, there was good access to treatment and so on and things. Um, <clears throat> Yeah. So, so, so uh, 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 just a, qu a quick uh, question related to that. So, one is, 
again, many of my colleagues on the call are vector biologists. Mm -hmm. uh, and a common question has always been, when you put something as wide scale as, as SMC, mm -hmm. how does this play out with an ITN? What should the strategy, strategy look like? Should we be doing, you know, mass, uh, this, this mass drug use at the same time, ITNs, or should we be prioritizing one, especially in seasonal, in cases where malaria is seasonal? Yeah. If you're going to be investing in SMC, should you also be investing in, 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 in this sort of thing? So the question is, how do you combine these strategies? Uh, yeah. The control and chemoprophylaxis, uh, given the function is kind I of the same. Go ahead. That's that's a good question. I mean, the answer is that they are doing different things. You know, the bed net is stopping you getting infected, and, and the SMC is killing any parasites that that get through. So you would expect them to, to at least to have an additive effect. Um, and so the answer is you want to do both. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, we think. Bed nets probably give you about 50%, ITNs probably give you about 50% protection um, against nothing. It's not having an SMC probably gives you about 70% protection against nothing. Um, and if you add those two, you're getting sort of 70% more on top of the 50% that's remaining and you're gradually doing more. So the, the answer is to do, do both. And the trials that we do now, we, we give the children um, and you know, make sure they have a bed net first and then add the SMC to that. Um, but if you had very, very limited amounts of money, would you spend it on ITNs or would you spend it on SMC? Then that's when the science comes in. You know, you'd need yeah. some economists to help you on that um, to yeah. decide which would be the, uh, the most yeah. economic way of using your money. And then that might vary from different areas, depending on the intensity of the transmission and so on and things. So we just hope that these sort of very difficult decisions are guided by science and good. you know, good understanding of the epidemiology, including the vectors and what's going on and so on, and then trying to come up with a rational decision. The, the, the question about immunity. Uh, so one of the earlier concerns was, you know, you were explaining earlier that SME, SS, uh, that, that the chemoprophylaxis in children would lower their levels of yeah. immunity. Has this claim ever been made against bed nets as well? It, it's never been clearly demonstrated. It was expected. And that was one of the, there was criticism, one of the criticisms why bed nets were, laying up, there were two, um, you know, that, that it was very harmful. Um, that the insecticide would harm people sleeping under the net. Uh, so there's a sort of toxicity. And that was even broadcast once on the BBC in the UK. Um, there's a risk of bed nets. Well, they said killing children, actually. <laughs> I think they mis mis that was a misquote from something they picked up. But that was a risk and a, a genuine one. I mean, I think any malaria control tool that is effective and stops people getting malaria, whether it's a vaccine, a drug, uh, a vector control measure, and then you stop and the level of transmission is just as high as it was before you started your intervention, then you are at risk of getting more malaria. And for that study that you just showed the picture, we did actually show that those, some of those children in that trial had, uh, which we now call SMC, um, up to five, up to, up to, up to well, some had it actually from, Three, three months up to sort of five years. And, uh, and there was still protection that year, but in the year after they stopped, um, they got an increased incidence of malaria, but there wasn't an increase in mortality. Um, they had more clinical attacks, yeah. malaria, not mortality, but the numbers were relatively small. So we couldn't exclude, you know, can't say from that, that there might not have been some small increase in mortality. So it definitely will happen. And it is very surprising that that is actually not um, being okay. studied, particularly in the SMC, because um, SMC has been going for several years now. We did two studies after children had had it for one year together with a bed net. Um, and the risk in the year after that was uh, was small. It was an odds ratio of 1.1 or something. But we are just about to start the children in the combined RTSS plus SMC study plus BedNet study in Burkina and Mali. Those first children are, are uh, 
have stopped. They've got up to five years old. And this transmission season, we're going, going to look to see where we, uh, whether they have a rebound. Um, but that would be the sort of first study that's looked at. And I suspect they will. But would you rather have a slight increase of clinical malaria when you're six years old than saving having 10 times as many attacks when you were in the first five years of your life. Um, well, the, I, I don't know if my, my colleague uh, um, uh, Ali Oloto is on the call, but I, I do remember an RTSS study that demonstrated uh, a slight increase in malaria yeah. risk uh, yeah. seven years down the line. Yeah. Uh, hold those thoughts there because we're going to be talking very, very, very shortly about vaccines. Yeah. But uh, Shayla, you want to check the next one about these combinations? Uh, so there's a, a question in the chat box from um, Muda Kafi. Uh, so she's asking, he, not sure if he or she is asking that what exact criteria, what is the exact criteria for areas for possibility of implementation of SCMC? Mm. Before we implement SCMC, SMC, what criteria should we have in place? Yeah, uh, that's a good question, because at the start, we had to make some sort of rather arbitrary <laughs> decisions, and it was actually done on, the, on rainfall, um, because there, wasn't, there was very little data on the incidence of malaria in young children across Africa by month. Um, I think when that study was done, there were only about 10, 10 studies that did that, but it, it obviously, where you get your highly seasonal rainfall. I mean, in the Sahel areas, there may be no rain or virtually no rain for seven months of the year, and then the rain starts and then your malaria starts. So it, the decision was made on a WHO recommendation, which you can read or I can send to you, um, was based on the rainfall and also on the intensity of the transmission. And that was when the involvement of the economists and social scientists things came into those sort of decisions because if you're the question of what you should be doing in in southern and southeastern africa if there may there are some areas there where the transmission is very seasonal i mean would meet that criterion on rainfall or probably on perhaps on the monthly incidence of malaria but the attack rate is very low um and it's perhaps over all age groups rather than just in, being in the young children. And then looking at the science, and taking everything together, you might decide that that would not be um, a sensible way of using resources, both uh, logistic resources and the people distributing the drugs and the money. So it really, it, well, again, it brings in the entomologist, uh, the epidemiologist, you need to know what the distribution of cases of malaria is. It, by month of year um, and what age group is seriously affected by that and what the intensity of the infection is, how many cases there are, and then take all of that into consideration um, and decide whether this will be a sensible thing to do. I remember a conversation a long time with the, the Professor Bob Snow. Yes. Um, uh, and, and I think the argument was that uh, uh, maybe Bob is in the call, I don't know, uh, that even in places like Tanzania, if you have, you know, more than 60% of malaria in a certain district happening within six, within four months of the year, that you might start thinking about SMC in places. Yeah, yeah no, it's true. And, and part of the reason why it was only recommended for the site, because from the drug resistance point of view, it's probably not a good idea to use the same drugs for prevention and distributing those very wi widely as the ones that you uh, want to use for treatment of cases, um, because you will increase resistance. I mean, uh, if drugs are distributed yeah. to the whole population for several years, you will increase resistance. Um, and that's the price to pay for saving some lives. Um, and it was fortunate that SP and amadaquin still work reasonably well in West African countries and therefore it was possible to, the recommendation was to use SP plus AQ, but you would not be able to do that in parts of Tanzania or Mozambique or some of the other areas where there right. is no transmission. And then you might be, so the only thing to use then would probably be an ACT. Um, 
and then there would be concerns, you know, should you be using DHA piperoquine or something which is or QR10 that you're using for treatment and encourage optimism resistance to come. Um, so that was why those areas were excluded. Matt Cairns was the person who drew the map um, that was used by WHO in his recommendations. And it, I, we've been discussed that that actually needs, that study needs doing again um, for somebody to look at that because there is more data and the epidemiology has changed. The incidence of malaria has gone down and there may be some seasonal areas where actually malaria has nearly gone away and SMC, you'd stop doing it then um, you know, if you got down to a very low, low level. So I think this comes back to the epidemiology, the surveillance. Um, you know, it should be all these decisions should be based on good data. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Maybe we move yeah. forward. Michelle, no, I have a question. So in relation to this, and you probably answered that, but I didn't get it. So when you're coming up with new tools such as MDA, usually the best line for testing would be that uh, your best line is where you have bed nets and so you would be putting bed net MDAs on top of bed yeah, nets. Yeah, definitely. So when you're thinking about when you're thinking about these new tools that are coming up, yeah. how best should we measure the effect size given that when you um, when you overlap this or, or when you lay together these new interventions with the bed nets, you yeah. see a very small effect size. How would we measure that? Well, you, you have to do that. I mean, that's what, you know, we, I think we'd all agree, if we looked at that graph from Dr. Bat, that ITNs in most areas of Africa certainly are the best tool. So you have to, have that, that has to be the first thing. Then if you're going to add something on to do that, then you have to have that against the background. You couldn't withdraw giving ITNs. Um, so the trials that, the SMC trials were done, the children were given a new bed net at the beginning of the study to make sure that that was taken account for. And still again, we were able to show you had 70% protection against malaria. So that was a particularly effective intervention. Now in RT, where we're doing the RTSS seasonal vaccination, so this is giving the children a booster of RTSS vaccine just before the rainy season. The children have got a bed net, they're getting SMC, and then on top of that, um, we have given them the vaccine. The effect site, you're right, would be less than if we just did it against nothing, um, but it wouldn't be ethical to do that. And in fact, I, I can't give the details yet, we, we have been able to show you get an uh, effect, but you probably then do need to use quite large numbers if you're looking for a, you know, you, you're adding on a new um, trapping method for mosquitoes or something, and you expect that might have a 20% effect, then if on top of ITNs and SMC, then you need a, quite a big trial to do that. Um, needs thousands of children. So the, the slide we have on, on the screen there, yeah. this example from Zambia, Yeah. Uh, this is uh, the study by ASL, yeah. and, and they have very good coverage of IRS, two rounds of IRS, and yeah. also ITNs, yes. and then they have an underlying case management in the yeah. regular hospital, and they are trying to test mass drug administration yeah. Yeah. and a household one, focal drug administration. Yeah. This must be really difficult to, to prove yeah. anything. Yeah. It, is, it is. I mean, you need big studies and <laughs> expensive studies. I mean, that's, yeah. that's the problem. Is but, this going to be a, a problem in the future or should we re well, re change the way one, we design one, the studies? Yes, one thing that we haven't mentioned so far in the discussion is actually modeling. Um, and I think this is where uh, you know, mathematical modeling can be really helpful um, because they can, if the right sort of background information is available, it can very often be uh, get some good estimate of what might happen using modeling in a situation in which to prove in the field would need an enormous expensive study. Um, and so sometimes decisions might have to be made like, like that. Um, and I, you know, I can give an example, if you're trying to use anti-malarial drugs to stop transmission uh, in an area where you've got seasonal malaria, do you give them, which time of the year would you give them? Um, now to do the trial to sort of prove that would have to be huge and things. And the modelers can help and say, well, 
probably if you want to stop transmission, you should give them in the dry season um, rather than in, in the rainy season things. And I guess in sort of, you know, that group working in that, I mean, there may be somebody on the call there, um, you know, they're very experienced and they've done a lot of the very detailed epidemiology modeling things. And that may have actually helped them in deciding how you've designed the trial, how many, how, how many people you need and so on. Um, and it probably has to be some sort of a community trial. Um, <clears throat> so, but you can't just drop bed nets if it's known you know, that it's an appropriate intervention in that area because the mosquitoes are biting at night time and so on and things, and it's recommended just because you want to show you have a new, new, to, new tool. And this is when it, things get really quite difficult um, <clears throat> for the big studies. Yeah. And, and once you have, uh, so once you have um, implemented or when you're testing MDA, is there any risk when you withdraw it? What happens? Does malaria transmission rise? It can, well, the, the, the most famous study of that is the one in Garki in northern Nigeria. Um, and there they used everything then. They used IRS. They, I, I think they even did some larvae siding uh, and they gave mass drug administration. And they, and that's a very high seasonal area sort of area would be having SMC point probably is having SMC now and they dropped the level of parasitemia down from 60 percent to two or three percent and that stayed for a year or two and then they stopped and it just bounced straight back up again back up. yeah and we know that will happen um, so one of you know the generally the recommendations for using MDA now is from the WHO, okay, is it an emergency? Um, and in the last stages of an elimination campaign, and say on, if you're on Zanzibar and you really did want to stop transmission completely on Zanzibar, you'd use every tool that you could. Um, you know, you'd have, you might be using IRS and everybody has a bed net and using mass drug administration, but you would do that say three times and not be planning to use that as a, continuing control tool right. um, and so you're just hitting them the mosquito and the parasite in every direction you can for a short period of time so that you can stop the transmission and then but, but just doing and it then, and then after you stop yeah then it will go back again if, if you haven't <laughs> stopped if you haven't got rid of the last or nearly the last malaria parasite but there's little point in doing that in the middle of drc for one year and then stopping um, yeah, you know, we'll yeah. just go back to back to what you've done. Yeah, there's um, another question on um, SMC from Adrian Luti. He's asking, uh, what is the regimen for RTSS being used for boosting the SEM, SMC context? So what 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 the trial that's been done there is so they get SMC as four times in their own set. So the idea is which is a new idea, I think, that we've been developing over the last few years, is people who live in Europe will know you go every year if you're over a certain age in the beginning of the winter to go and get your flu vaccine because that's when flu transmission happens. There isn't much in the summer. And if you're uh, in the older age group or a risk group, you go to get your your vaccination in, in at that time of the year, it was in sort of November or somewhere. So we had the idea of, well, what, we know that malaria is really seasonal there. Why don't we use seasonal vaccination? Why instead of just giving your malaria vaccine at particular age times, boost, boost it during the, um, <clears throat> the, the rainy season. So what we've done in this trial, so we did, have, everybody gets a net, we did actually withdraw SMC, and so some children have just been getting the vaccine, and some have been getting SMC, and some have been getting both. And that was a risky thing to do because SMC is recommended, and you know, would could we use the malaria vaccine as an alternative? And I mean, this was discussed with all the ethics committees and everybody. I mean, they agreed this was there was enough evidence to do this. So that's been done very carefully. And then each year we've actually, the DSMB has gone over the data and so on and said, is it still safe to go on with RTSS alone? And, we, and we, we've done that. So what the, the children were primed with three doses for the RTSS, which is what you get um, in, in 
when they were in at monthly intervals, when they were three to five, seven months after. And then for the next three years, three years, four, four years coming up to this year, they get a booster dose just before they, they, the malaria transmission season and yeah. until they finish their SMC. Uh, Brian, Brian, Brian the, on, on that point that you're raising, uh, um, here is a common concern, which is, uh, um, and, and it's part of the reason we were asking you about people integrating disciplines. Yeah. So if you have uh, epidemiologists working on their own, you end up with a, a, a strategy such as, let us use four doses of a vaccine. Yeah. But if they're working with a vector biologist, you end up with a strategy that says, no, let's use two doses of a vaccine and a vector control. Yeah. So in, 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 a, in a test situation, it's probably okay. But when you have to test four doses of a drug or a vaccine, yeah. what is, is, is there any thinking among the people testing it about whether this will ever be applicable anywhere in, in Africa? Yeah, well, I think it's part you know, of the, the discussion. Yeah, I mean, SM, SMC is an example. You know, I mean, yeah. when we did those, you know, the first study you, you saw, I mean, you know, we were yeah. paying people to give the drugs. <laughs> I, I don't, we weren't, no, that's not true, actually. They were community volunteers, but it was done under, as a trial right. to, to do that. So, so then the question, then we did the studies in Burkina Faso and Mali, which they were, which they were being paid. I mean, they were community workers or getting some recompense. For, so the question was, could you, could you do this? Um, and I, I was doubtful, you know, within Northern Nigeria, would you be able to distribute SMC or in Chad, um, where the health systems are not well developed and you know, things are generally a bit difficult. Um, and so the study, the thing was in which the malaria consortium did, and then there were other studies of so people tried and said somewhat to my surprise, it could be done and it ha has been done. And the yeah. levels of coverage that have been achieved through the SMX access have been very, very high. So, because I think the people in the community appreciated what was going on and they could see an effect. Um, I mean, the number of children in the pediatric ward with malaria during the transmission was, was noticeably less to some that you didn't have to be doing some precise calculations and so on you know it was an obvious effect and, and that makes it easier but if you were looking for you had a new say a new most vector control method of something which you don't get you not going to get such a big effect but could still be very useful and important uh, and, and often 20 percent or 30 percent is chosen as something you know you'd think was practically important then designing your trial so you can be sure you pick that up if that was the true is really is really difficult if you uh, can't do it against nothing um, right. yeah i think uh, maybe we, we we carry forward we have only half an hour uh, 20 minutes left so uh, brian do you want to take a break for I'm, I'm okay for 20 minutes if you're okay or just everybody what's the <laughs> what's the consensus <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm okay. It's, yeah, I'm okay it's for 20 minutes. Okay, that's, yeah. let's get it over with. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that I can relax. We, will, we'll, we are looking at the chat box as well. And uh, Sheila, do you still have a question on the slide or we move? Um, yeah, there's a question. There was a question on um, related to uh, in the chat box. Um, related to, I think that was partially answered, but related to drug resistance um, related to MDA, mm. how do we tackle that? Yes. Well, I think, you know, that's the, the number of parasites that are exposed to the drug for how long is, the, is one of the factors that influences drug resistance. So you, we do want to keep that down as much as you can. Um, but sort of done once or twice or something. It's again, I'm not like the modelers and things are, are, are gone into this in a lot, a lot more detail. And I'm not an expert in this, in this area, but the sort of common sense answer is that the more you expose, the more parasites you expose to the drug for the longest period, more period of time, then you will be encouraging resistance. So it's not quite as straightforward as that, but that's a reasonable, a reasonable sort of assumption. And so if you go on, giving MDA 
to the whole population, uh, exposing all the parasites in that population for month after month after month, then you're more likely to get resistance coming. Um, and that's the whole idea of things like IPTI and SP, SMC and IPTP is that you're really focusing on knowing you will be probably encouraging resistance, but you're really focusing on the groups that will get the most benefit for that. So you accept a bit of harm, but the benefit is going to be much better. And you want to make sure that that ratio is as good as you, as good as you can. So just sort of giving MDA without a particular purpose and continuing it month after month after month, um, unless it's a really clear reason for doing it is probably not a good idea. Cool. Uh, we're going to ask you some questions about the vaccines. Yes. <laughs> this right. has been alluded to many times. Yes. I, I think to begin with, uh, could you just provide, I mean, the, the most advanced at the moment is the RTSS, of course. Yes. Mm -hmm. Could you yeah. just provide an, a brief overview of the current state of malaria vaccine? Yeah. That's, a, Where are we? that's a, big it's a big question. I mean, so we, there are three pre-erythrocytic malaria vaccines again, which act against sporozoite or against the liver stage, um, which are RTSS, which is the most advanced one. Um, you know, and it's been 30 years in, in, in de development. Yeah, I think you've got the picture. The pic picture that, um, which showed in this series of trials that it is effective, which was important. So we had the malaria vaccine that was effective. Um, and it's very effective for a, a few months after it's given, which is why another reason why we had the idea of seasonal vaccination, because you only need to protect for a few months. But if yeah. you follow up for four years or five years or something, the efficacy wanes and it goes down to sort of over that four or five years period, perhaps 30% or something like that. That region, if you get to five to 17 months old. But again, the people, the, the modelers and the economists and so on, looked at that and said, yes, if provided the price for the vaccine is um, reasonable, in, in, similar to other more complicated vaccines, then it's cost effective and sensible to implement that in certain areas. Again, using surveillance, using epidemiology. Um, to define where those areas would be. And those would be the areas where you have high transmission and uh, malaria going on throughout the, throughout the year. So that seemed reasonably straightforward. So there could have been a recommendation, but the problem was that there were some safety signals, um, one of which was an increase in meningitis <clears throat> in the children who had RTSS, which seemed very strange, but it was there. And also, perhaps a bit more cerebral malaria, and also raised by Peter Arby that there was an increase in deaths in the females. Um, there was some sort of imbalance there. So there was a bit of nervousness about just recommending this um, for use through the EPI. And so what WHO did was to uh, suggest that there were pilot studies done on a large scale with hundreds of thousands of children in which safety would be looked at whether you could give four doses and whether you still got efficacy when you did this on a large scale. And those trials are in Malawi, in Kenya and Ghana. And they're fairly near. I think there will be some results this year from those, those pilot studies. And then, then there will be a decision. Um, one of the new developments has just happened is that um, GSK has come to an arrangement with uh, a company in India, Bharat, to make the vaccine. And they're used to making vaccines at large scale for, for NMICs. So that's a good move so that they would be able to make the vaccine in the sort of numbers that would be needed if it was to be recommended quite widely across Africa. And if it were recommended, would it be recommended as a seasonal vaccine? No, well, that is a big question. <laughs> I, it, it's really difficult because we um, our, our results all I can say is they're very encouraging of seasonal vaccinations. The paper in the New England Journal, which is under review, so I can't tell you what the what okay. results are, but it will certainly be considered as an option, um, in which it might be seasonal vaccine. So they might recommend 
doing it by age in countries where the malaria goes on all year and, and they might recommend it for seasonal vaccination or they may say more studies are needed or something. Um, so that's RTSS. Um, then the other sort of similar vaccine is R21, which was developed in Oxford by the Jenner Vaccine Institute. And this is a similar uh, um, vaccine it is based on this circumsporocyte protein, but it uses a different adjuvant. Um, it's possibly more effective than RTSS, though it's not, that's not proven, but it's a, the challenge studies and a, one study in Burkina Faso suggests that it's is likely to be that. And the, the big thing about that is that it's the Serum Institute in India have agreed to make this vaccine and they are the biggest vaccine manufacturers in the world. 60% of all the children in the world have one of their vaccines at some stage. Um, you know, so they're a giant in the field. And if they put their resources behind it, then that would be a huge step forward to getting the vaccine used if it's proved to be efficacious. And so currently that's about to start in a few weeks time, a phase three trial of R21 in Tanzania, Kenya, Burkina Faso and Mali. And in Burkina Faso, Mali will be used as a seasonal vaccine and in Kenya and Tanzania as sort of through the routine EPI. Um, and then the third one is PFSPZ, Cenarius vaccine, which is irradiated sporozoites, um, which has proved to be highly efficacious for a short period of time and in challenge studies. And uh, that's that field trials going on in various places in Equatorial Guinea, in um, in. Uh, Mali, I think, you know, due to start in Indonesia, but I think they're targeting first as this is a vaccine for possibly for travelers or the military, um, but because it gives, again, a high level of protection, but only for a short, relatively short period, and then to move to using that uh, perhaps later in endemic populations. So those are the three main pre-erythrocytic vaccines. Um, developing a vaccine against a blood state has proved much more difficult and that's probably partly because there's such a lot of, uh, of antigenic variation going on or different different strains which a vaccine might not work against and um, but there is one encouraging development in that area with the vaccine again being developed at Oxford called RH5 which and that antigen seems to be very essential for the um, parasite and it doesn't seem to change very much. Um, but when you're, when you're developing a pre-erythrocytic vaccine, there are only perhaps 10 sporozoites going to the, into the liver and 10 schizons. Um, and so if you can kill all of those, you know, you've only got to kill 10. Once you're dealing with the blood, you're into millions, millions and millions and billions perhaps of parasites that your vaccine's got to work against to be completely effective. Um, and that's a tough, a tough challenge. Um, and yeah. I, th I think in doing that, but uh, RH5 does look promising, but it's fairly early in its development yet. And then there's the transmission blocking vaccines. And that's been really difficult. They seem to be very difficult ones to make, but there is some progress with that. And there's one called uh, PFS230, which looks quite promising, but that again, that's a, a little way to go. But I could, you could see that what one might end up using is using a pre-erythrocytic vaccine. I mean, you might use R20, R21, RH5, and a transmission blocking vaccine, you know, and have all of those together in your shot. Um, and that's the maybe the way it will go. I don't see suddenly somebody coming up with a new antigen and a new vaccine, a new antigen and a new vaccine against one antigen that gives you 95% protection. Um, there are a lot of people on the chat asking about, you know, uh, whether the coronavirus uh, situation is going to help with the vaccine. Yes, I think so. I, I think it is because it's suddenly that, that I think that there are lots of harmful consequences. We've been talking about COVID um, having an effect on the economy and finances and turning things away from malaria and thing, another thing. But one really strong Thing that will be positive is suddenly people have realized the value of vaccine um right. and if i was sort of 
looking at my crystal ball, I think there's going to be more money spent on malaria vaccines, actually, um, that people will realize that maybe that is the solution. And one, one huge thing, well, it would also apply to gene drive, but also to apply to vaccines, is that they do help with equity. <laughs> um, right you know, having a bed net sort of, if certainly if people having to pay for it and so on. If you imagine, you know, we have examples with polio and just recently in DRC you know, with the Ebola vaccine, even in troubled areas where there's not a lot of uh, some disturbing things, you can distribute a vaccine, you know, that people will do that. So that does, there are advantages as a vaccine, as a, as a control tool. And I think, I suspect, especially as because Oxford's been very involved in the COVID and the malaria vaccines, that malaria vaccines may get more support and, and faster support because these, well, we've looked, you've got the slide there, 30 years <laughs> for getting, I mean, that, that could have all been done in two years, probably, um, if there'd been yeah. the resources and the commitment and, the knowledge that we have now and so on and things um but there just wasn't the really commitment to doing that and everybody had to fight for their next grant or their next bit of money and so on yeah fred there's a, uh, there was another question earlier on related to this from yeah. muhammad afolabi mm. so he's asking given the complexity of malaria parasites antigens that contributed to the challenges of developing effective malaria vaccines what are your thoughts on the recent initiative of using the COVID-driven RNA platform? Yeah, I, but I, I didn't, I, if that's been actually tried in the malaria vaccine, I don't know about that. I'm out of date on that. But again, that is an example of, of using the platform um, and research helping because the Oxford, what, what is the Oxford uh, COVID vaccine or AstraZeneca one was actually is the backbone for that it was developed for Ebola and also for a malaria vaccine at one stage for a trap vaccine and and that if you have that a system like that in which they and RNA is obviously example which you can change very quickly um, into doing that that's I think that's a, a lesson that's been learned because like for the COVID, they're going to have to change the vaccine, perhaps even by the end of this year with a new variant comes. But if you have a platform, uh, which in the case of it is a adenovirus as your vector or RNA or something, then it may be much easier to develop new vaccines much more quickly if all you've got to do is just change the antigen. Um, now, it sounds simple. It's probably much more complicated than that. But you... you you don't have to start from scratch with a whole new sort of delivery system and a new adjuvant and, and so on. So I think vaccine development will get quicker mm, um, thanks and, to COVID. And, and actually, with our, our next question was going to be about the time, it, the, the challenges that you had with the SPF 66, uh, the very fast uh, the vaccine. I think you guys refer to it as the Pata Royal vaccine. So. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the, the, the idea that even though it failed, uh, you, you and colleagues were able to build systems for testing. Yeah, uh, yeah I time. think that's true. I mean, it didn't work. It was a long story. We haven't got time to go. <laughs> there were politics and geopolitics and all sorts yeah. of things involved in that in that story. But it was useful. In in I mean the. the standard way, especially for the seasonal areas that of looking at whether children get episodes of malaria, going to the hospital, seeing them get hospital admissions, doing community cross-sectional surveys, um, and when it's appropriate, doing some entomological studies, doing some social science studies and so on. That methodology, which is now used pretty widely for all new inter interventions, that, that wasn't the only thing that did that, but it helped to develop that sort of methodology. Um, and it, perhaps it's a little bit like having a platform for making your vaccine. You know, we do have a, right. we know how to do it. Now you don't have to start from scratch. Um, right. And right. if you have a new vaccine, uh, I, I mean, if it was a transmission blocking vaccine, then you want to be looking at, at your mosquitoes as well as looking at the humans and so on and things. So we now have the sort of the methodology for doing all those things well. Right. Uh, Brian, just for the, for the sake of time, we're going to move a little faster. Uh, the, the, 
there was a time in your career when you you had this question. You 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 asked whether we still need a vaccine. <laughs> yeah. uh, I found this very interesting. But you know, when we re when we were reading, we were preparing for the master class, we find this at, at certain point. At, at some point during your career, you were a little excited about the new developments, and yeah. you even thought that maybe, just maybe. We, we could beat malaria without ever getting a vaccine. Yes. Your, your, your mind changed, right? Yeah, I've changed on that one. <laughs> we all make mistakes in our... Right, yeah, yeah. And you just have to own up to... <laughs> it's, it's a good there, is, there is a question mark there, in fairness. Yeah. So I did put a question mark there, but no, I've changed that, you know. Um, that's, I mean, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. Things look, look good and, and for some, some kind, you know, South Africa or Botswana or... Danzibar or something is, is going to be able to do it without a vaccine. Um, yeah. But in those difficult areas, we're going to use, need everything. Yeah, you, you've singled out two technologies here uh, for purposes of you know, sustaining the gains. Mm. You've singled out in particular, uh, and you talked earlier about this also, you've singled out the issue of vaccine. Mm. And for vector control, you've singled out the, 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 the topic of uh, gene drives. Yes. So gen mm. genetically modified. Mm. Yep, I Just agree. again, I... one more emphasis. Why these two? Why do you think these are the two possible games? Well, we do know a bit more about that in the, we know vaccines, are, as we've seen in the last few months, you know, if you have the right vaccine, you can deliver it. Um, 20 million people in the UK you know, being vaccinated in six weeks or something. Um, so that, that's a tool we know how to, how, how to use and it works and it's going to stop the boat. So if we could get a vaccine that gave you 90% protection and yeah. lasted for five years, that, that would probably stop transmission, um, except in the very, very highest areas. Um, but no, it's, I don't think that's going to happen in the next few years. I mean, gene drive approaches, you know, or genetically modified mosquitoes and then having the gene, gene drive to drive, the, I mean, it has the potential to totally revolutionize the malaria control. And uh, again, so I'm a bit out of my depth here, but listening in some of the things we've listened in together with Frederos and things that, I mean, theoretically, if you, the whole thing sort of works and you release 100 correctly modified mosquitoes, they can spread all over Africa and problem, problem over. Um, now, there are many, caveats to that and all sorts of things and so on. But, but theoretically, that is possible. I mean, it, that could really be a, 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 a real major game changer. And yeah. I can't think of others that, but as we said at the beginning, some clever scientist sitting somewhere had some idea that we really haven't thought about. Um, yeah. And it, it, at the moment, it's, you know, there's a paper just taking out on using Eve tubes or, um, sugar baited traps or something. I mean, these are all very helpful, helpful things could be used in the right way in the right places. Then one wouldn't really call those a game changer. Um, they're going to be incremental in helping us gradually to get on, on top of malaria. But yeah. theoretically, gene drive could be a game changer. But there are many challenges to that. Uh, yeah, but I mean, it's it's important that uh, uh, we, we believe in a lot of things, <laughs> Brian. You say yeah. so. If 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 there is, if success is one of the possible you know outcomes, then I think a lot of people would want to try that route. Just yeah. the same way we want to try the route of the vaccination as yeah. well. Uh, yeah. My colleague Sheila is gonna um, check the next question. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Fred. Uh, so, <laughs> Brian, we have a lot of uh, very early career scientists yeah. on the line and um, well, while well, we, st we still have them on the line, we would like to know from you if you had any mentors during yes. your career. Um, and, and one personal one from me is, uh, since I have the chance to ask you is, why epidemiology and not vector control or entomology? <laughs> yeah, okay, I'm gonna ask that. Well, mentor, yes, I definitely had mentor. I mean, we, hopefully we all have some mentors, and, uh, but I can also uh, answer both these questions in one way, because when I was at secondary 
school, I was encouraged to become a butterfly collector. Um, you know, like you collect pebbles on the beach or rare books or something. I mean, it, we, there's an inherent uh, desire in some people anyhow to collect things. And we were encouraged to collect butterflies um, and pin them and keep them in your cabin and try and catch a rare one. But the master who did that was actually a Latin, a classic classics master, but he was very good. And he made us I mean, uh, learn about genetics, uh, about a little bit about ecology and so on and things at the same time as the threat of finding a new, a new butterfly. So he was really important and he was actually, he named, he, he focused on microlepidoptera um, and he wrote a book not so long before he died uh, with explaining all the Latin names and how they came and so on things. So he, he was actually quite, quite knowledgeable about that. And he certainly got me interested in, in and I've kept up that interest to some extent. Um, so I might have become an entomologist. <laughs> so I had some training there, but I got sort of drawn off into other areas of science and, and clinical medicine. And then after I graduated, that we there was a, a professor called at Liverpool called Professor Gillis, who was from Maltese, and he was very kind to me and my wife when we were in northern Nigeria. And sometimes we all go through rough times in your in your uh, careers when things are not going well or things are happening. And having somebody there, I can think somebody else who's there just to offer a hand when it's it's needed something you could go to. And he said, I mean, in his case, he was sort of saying, well, you know, Brian Annis, I know you were having a tough time. Would you like to come and stay in my flat on Malta when you have your holiday and things? But that it's the gesture showing that somebody cares about you um, and how you're getting on with your, your career. And those things you remember all your life, I think. So it's really important to have somebody who you can turn to like that. And that's slightly different from having the more scientific mentor who can help you with how you do the next experiment or do this and the other. And I think, you know, in the capacity development programs we've been working on in the last few years, that's something that there has been confusion about, about who is your sort of scientific supervisor um, or your PhD supervisor, if you're a PhD student and your mentor um, and your PhD supervisor or your postgraduate so and your sponsor like that should, should be <laughs> helping you on he should be talking to you every you know i was talking to one of my phd students this morning we talk every couple of weeks or something that's different from your mentor the mentor is somebody who is helping you guide on your decisions of your future career or you know why don't you think about going to applying for that job or things or who you can come to mm. in in, in the time we had a problem. And I think they're both very important. Mm. So, so yeah, and, well, go ahead, Sheila. And I was just going to ask, so th this is a favorite topic of mine. So I was just going to ask, because you have really clarified what a mentor is. Yeah. So what's the difference between that and a sponsor? And a sponsor? I'm not, not really familiar with a sponsor. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> that's, 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 that's fine. fine. This is, this is we'll... a new term I'm learning. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's time. No. yeah we can discuss later that. And, uh, it was very interesting in one of the, when we were doing, so we moved from the Gates Malaria Partnership and Malaria Capacity Development Consortium and so on. Thing, and people were given that when they got their PhD, the postdocs were given the chance of choosing who their mentor was. Um, and the more junior ones chose a mentor in their own country or perhaps even in their own institution or in their own university. The more senior ones who are sort of had had more experience then chose somebody outside the, somebody more international um, to help them, you know, who would be a contact if you needed to contact somebody in France who could help you with your entomology or something. Um, and no, that worked pretty. That worked pretty well, and we learned quite a lot about what you do in your mentor. You know what your mentor should do, and we had a co they had a contract with their mentee, um, and they had agreed that this is what they would do, and they would meet up. The aim was to meet, I think, every twice a year or something. Um, now that could be done by by Zoom and things, but to have a bit of a hands off thing and not not to be there in the everyday 
things. And the, the problem, then you do need to keep those roles separate so that they each know what they're meant to be doing. So uh, uh, we have uh, two other questions related to this, but before that, I just, I want to make sure that we don't forget this. We have very specific questions that were sent to us in advance. Mm -hmm. One was from Rwanda, and I'm wondering whether Emmanuel Imainza is there from uh, the vector control technology uh, uh, expert uh, from, from Biomedical Center in Rwanda. Uh, we had a question that came from Jeffrey He in Southeast Asia, and uh, I believe we have a question from uh, uh, more uh, uh, I don't know how to pronounce the name, mm. but uh, Dr. Mohammed, uh, I have to check, Mohan Rao from India. Mm. So uh, I just want to check, but if you, you guys are still on the line, you could just post your question there or ask if you want to ask directly. And then once we finish this segment, we will check this before we close the show. Uh, Brian, you have been associated with capacity building for a long, long time. Yeah. Uh, and following your story, you see that you began actually by teaching in a local university in Nigeria. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and you were going to classroom. You were even a head of department at some point in a Nigerian yeah. university. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and this has transitioned many, many paths until today. We have the, the Malaria Capacity Development Consortium, yeah. which I understand now has been transferred to Dakar. Yeah. So it's back, back to Africa again. Yeah. I guess an important question here for you is for early career researchers or for junior faculty or department heads or research leaders, what lessons can they take to help build this capacity that endemic countries so dearly need? Mm. Uh, to, like, what are the core messages from the, all these processes that you took from your time in Nigeria to the transfer back of M MDC to, to Dakar? What lessons do we give the young people starting to do capacity building? In Africa, and, and maybe Southeast Asia as well. And, I think, yeah, it's a big. That's a big question. Um, we could yeah. have another. <laughs> we could have another s seminar on that. But I, I think it's choose like, it, for the young person sort of trying to get into the system. Yeah. It's choosing the right place and the right person. You know, because you do need. We all needed help at the beginning. You know, I was lucky to have people to to help. You didn't always agree with them so finding the right if you're wanting to do research you know, finding the right person trying to find somebody somebody to help you to get your 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 foot on the ladder and then it is a process which is fairly well established you know you probably if you want to become a, a scientific leader you probably do have to do a phd then um then again it's really important to find the right right place to do that the right person to work with um, because they're going to be people who may help you for the rest of your career then to your postdoc again probably a good idea to go somewhere else for a yeah. postdoc rather than doing it where you've been all the way through your career finding the right person and just gradually you know sticking with it um, and, and it's very difficult to do it on your own without having people to help you and support you at different stages through the through the process um and it it's it's a challenging job um and you know there are many things that people fall by the way because they get a university position and they just got so much te teaching to do yeah. they can't do their research um you can't get a a grant to support you on your PhD, you don't have enough money and so on and things. So it's not it's not a course of life to take um, lightly, but the rewards are great if you're really interested in the science and it's very exciting. You know, you find something, you've done something useful. Um, I, I, I certainly wouldn't go back and become a banker if I was starting again, you know, I might, <laughs> might be much richer than, than I, I was. And I was, Put up people when I first went back to Africa, it was rather unusual to do that. People thought I was a bit stupid because I could have been making more money in London and things. Um, so you yeah. have to get your priorities right, but you will find people who will help you and will encourage you. And it's a very rewarding thing when, thing, when things go well. Um, <clears throat> and it has become easier, actually, you know, the fact that we're having this session today, that was completely impossible. 10 years ago, um, yeah. it, it is now much more easy to be just last week, we had the Commonwealth Science Conference with young scientists from all over the Commonwealth 
together. And some outstanding, outstanding speakers, Judy McCartney was one of the ones, you know, gave an outstanding talk that the whole world sort of is available for that. And that, that so there are ways that one can learn and be encouraged and things now, much, much more than was possible if you were stuck in a small university in northern Nigeria or something. You know, it was quite hard for people to get those links. Um, so my message is, you know, don't be discouraged if you really want to do it, but now it's going to be a challenge. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Sheila. Um, no further questions. <laughs> We have, uh, do you have a question on this slide? Peer reviewed. No, 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 Fred. Okay. I think this is, uh, Brian, the, the question to hear was, <laughs> you you have nearly a thousand papers. I mean, the last count is about 800 peer reviewed <laughs> publications. Uh, I haven't seen anything like that before. So. It's, it's well, I've been doing it a long time. <laughs> I, I understand. If, 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 we were, if someone were to ask you, uh, and, and I have to say again, 800 peer-reviewed publications yeah. is a lot of publications. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If someone were to to ask you, which of these do you think was most transformative? What would it be? Difficult. Difficult. Difficult yeah. And it probably <laughs> changes. Um, I mean, the one that's probably had the most impact is probably the bed nets one, really, uh, I guess. Um, but, you know, nearly everything you do, somebody else is going to do it as well, unless you're an absolute genius, which happens to just, you know, you invent PCR or something. I mean, most of us are not going to do that. It, it, but you, can, you may be able to change something a bit, uh, uh, speed things up by what you did that somebody else wouldn't have done for another five years and so on and things. So, and it's not always easy to, I mean, if I could, we go back to the bed nets, I had no idea, you know, we sort of started work on bed nets, we're doing other things. That was just something else. So it wasn't yeah. apparent at that time that treating bed nets with an insecticide would, would be something, you know, we might've been, uh, I don't know, rescreening latrines or something to you know, stop the flies getting in or something. I mean, it wasn't very clear from that time that that was going to be really important. So you can't always in tell. Uh, no, 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 Baba. But you should keep I'm going. Back here, one more. Uh, I'm going back here. Sorry, guys. I, so anyhow, I think, I don't know what, yeah, that's, that's what, but you know, how you can do that, it comes back to being in teams. You know, we like working right. together. I've been extremely lucky to have very nice people to to work with my career. And you do write an odd paper yourself, you're, you're a review or something that you might be asked or a commentary or something. But, you know, all our work now is done through teams. Uh, it should right. be um, yeah. and important that everybody gets recognized in that. Um, and if you have a good team, you know, that's for coming back to, you know, doing a science career again, getting yourself in a good team, really critical. Yeah. No, thanks. Let's right. just, just go ahead, Sheila. No, I was just going to say that there's one last question from Charles. Yeah. Um, Charles Mulumba, do you want to ask? Okay, I can just sure. read it. Okay. Um, I can just read it on his behalf. So he's saying he's planning to assess the e efficacy of PF25, best transmission blocking yeah. vaccine candidates. Yeah. Um, he needs some thoughts on whether to focus on testing the vaccine against many different parasite isolates as possible or test against few parasite isolates with many mosquitoes. Yeah. I think I, I might not be the right person to answer that question, but um, I, I, if, if, if he sends me an email, then I could direct him to somebody who could give him yeah. a correct answer with that. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And on that note, if we have, a, I was informed earlier that we might have a question from the NMCP in Mozambique. So if, if we have 
anybody from NMC Mozambique who wanted to share the question, please uh, just let me know and we'll do that. Uh, I think we have only two questions to finish. Uh, and the last, the second one was for you, Brian, the question is, what do you think, uh, how would you rate the, the public engagement as a factor in uh, successful, in research success? Absolutely, absolutely essential, you know, and I yeah. think more, we're learning more and more about how important that that is. You know, we've seen in climate change, as an example, you know, that's coming. I mean, a Korean pop star <laughs> who's, you know, has the most most hits and so on, the thing is is getting a huge instrument, Greta Thunberg and so on, things, you know, that's coming from the next generation. Um, right. And, you know, that should be coming from the communities where malaria is still killing lots of children and so on and things like absolutely, you know, absolutely critical really and I think a move that's been appreciated that that's becoming even more important than we realized before really is to get community involvement and getting things coming from bottom up you know and I learned an awful lot being involved in the Ebola vaccine in Sierra Leone and so I mean that was very frightening going trying to set up vaccine trials yeah. then and people frightened and rumors and all of that and the important that that trial has been a success um, the importance of the community in that was absolutely huge you know i mean they took it on and did that and pushed and so on things so i think you know we all probably need to work involved with community right earlier in planning your projects and discussing yeah. things and getting their opinion as things go along so i've certainly learned a lot of that in the past few years do you think that uh, coronavirus is going to be uh, a major concern? I think, I think it, it were, you know, it, it obviously has had a had a problem. I think the malaria community has done very well. I think WHO GMP has done very well. You know, and everybody, it hasn't had the damage, really damaging effects that we might have expected on malaria, yeah. as far as we can tell. And I, you know, it's a, it's a Truism, but more many more people children died from malaria than they did than they were deaths from Ebola because Ebola just sort of shut down everything in the countries that were affected uh, in the health system and nobody would go to hospital or the clinic and so on and I think lessons were learned from that to some, um, so that there've been certainly malaria sort of preemptive efforts to make sure that as far as possible that didn't happen and I, I, I suspect there will have been some some increase and in some you know like yeah. hospital admissions and so on, but it certainly hasn't been as bad as might have happened. And, some, and that has come through some of the advocacy groups, the like NGOs and so on, things. Everybody was, was sort of prepared to make sure that COVID didn't stop malaria control happening. Um, That's good. And, have we, and again, you know, good things and bad things. I think one, one good thing will be the vaccine focus on yeah. how, how how effective vaccines can be if you get the right vaccine. Yeah. It would have been very damaging if the COVID vaccine hadn't worked. <laughs> but, right. and seeing the importance of science, you know, as I mentioned, you know, Chris Whitty is our senior medical, you know, and Andy Pollard and so on. I mean, they're, they're on the TV and the news every day and so on. They are advising the government and the government has, has, has taken their advice and that's I mean one thing we have haven't mentioned so far why of capacity development and sort of things I mean it's really important that the people in in endemic countries who are around to give advice to their their ministers are very well trained and smart you know and that those are the people who really have to be encouraging and leading and getting them into that position that you could become a Chris Whitty you know that yeah, I have the knowledge and the ability that you can tell the prime minister what to do, and he does it. Uh, um, and so that you know is a really important component of capacity development in your endemic countries. Thank you, thank you, Brian. Uh, Shella, did you have a question about the finances? Um, yeah. So, what are your views on um, funding for malaria? Well, I, we we touched on that. You know, at the beginning, I mean, you see the graph there, it's flat. And the consensus by the economists is we need about double that amount of money. Yeah. Really, 
make efforts and that is one of my worries about covid the fact that the uk you know the uk has been a very generous donor to malaria um and been one of these and they're cutting their budget substantially and, and how can they ask the kenyan or the tanzanian governments to increase their malaria spending when they see the wealthy countries cutting it back um so that is a real worry um and that needs the advocacy and so on everywhere to try and ensure that doesn't happen because we need more money and not less I think the, the question from NMCP in Mozambique finally came through. Did you see it, Sheila? Um, um, yeah, I saw it. I can read it out. Yeah. Can you read for Brian, um, please? Um, just a minute. Fred, yeah, are, feel... we getting, are we getting near to the end? Yes, <laughs> this is our last yeah. one. This is our last one. Yeah, and, yeah, in a few minutes. I mean, fine for a few minutes, Paul, but... So uh, the, the question the question is from Dr. Nelson from Mozambique. Yeah. Um, he would like to ask the he would like you to comment on the importance of appropriate communication in improving the efficiency of available tools for malaria control and elimination, yeah. particularly in communities where there is low or um, there is no formal education. No. I, I again that's. I mean, that's an important area. And this is where it's local knowledge. Um, I, I just tried to think of an example. When we were setting up the SMC study, we had to have some method. We had a, a, a card to record that. And most of the population was illiterate. Um, <laughs> and so we we sort of, well, what, what are we going to do about it? And then somebody said, well, why don't you write something in Arabic letters? Because it was a Muslim community. You know, most people can know a little bit about the Quran and, and use that and use some Arabic letters and they might not be actually be able to read, but then you could use that as your indicator. Well, I would never have thought of, of that as a way of doing that. You know, that was a message coming from the community um, to do that. And if you're trying to, communicate within the community, the best people to advise you how to do that are the people within the community um, and having your community. Now, now in all the trials and things we do, we certainly have community participation groups and getting feedback and so on and things. And, and they will help in how you should do your messaging. But it's, it's no use somebody just coming from the capital and um, yeah. doing that. And I, I think um, Mohammed Afalabi was on the call, I was asking a question. I mean, for his PhD, he did a nice study in which he was using visual, getting consent, using sort of new approaches, using visual things as well as just talking to people and so on. So there are ima imaginative ways of doing that, but very important. Thank you so, so much, uh, uh, Brian, for spending all this time with us. Um, <laughs> I think I think we, we took even much more time than, than you wanted. And <laughs> um, that than, than, than was possible for you. Uh, in, in summary, I think uh, that it's, it's from my end and from my colleagues, uh, we've learned quite a lot. We can go back to this journey towards ending malaria, even if it's a challenge. Uh, I would like to finish by saying uh, thank you very, very much. But first, uh, Shayla, do you want to say a word to Brian before he leaves? Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Brian. Um, this was a very informative uh, masterclass. It was an honor um, to get uh, direct experience and knowledge from you. Um, yeah, thank you very much for your time. Good. Yeah. Thank Bye. you indeed, uh, Brian. Do you have any message for our colleagues, for us? And oh, I just say I th hope that was interesting. <laughs> this was very interesting. Yeah. It's, you know, and keep up the good effort because. <laughs> I'm getting to the end of my, my carrying the baton. It's time for somebody else. To go. But, you know, it's a, sure some of you will be giving a masterclass in 20 years' time, and I expect you'll still be talking about malaria. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Most definitely. Okay. Thank, you. thank you again. And to okay. everybody on the line, please, thank you for, okay. for bye spending then. time. Bye-bye, uh, Brian. Bye. 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 And uh, bye, Brian. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Professor and Brian. And to all our colleagues on the line, thank you so much for taking your thank time. You. Thank you. Until the end, you thank stay. You. Thank, thank you, thank you, Thank you very much. You have a thank wonderful you. time.
Thank you. Uh, and we wish everybody Thank you. a great week. Bye. Thank you. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs> Shayla, bye. 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 Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Someone is just joining, so I think we admit the person joining and then say bye to them. <laughs>